Hello Ron, my Monday here. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite uh, PlayStation X games, PlayStation 1. And this game I want to go into as a hidden gem because the last one was Soul Emeralds. And Soul Emeralds, I complain about the storyline. The storyline is pretty crap, the overall storyline is pretty mm, and so on, right? So this, this game is, then, is, I would say, it has the best storyline to PlayStation 1 then. Uh, so right now, if you the internet, come at me because I know a lot of people are going to say you're an idiot. Because you're going to say that Exxon Gears is the best game. And uh, so this game, Exxon Gears, is a, it's a game that people are going to claim is the best uh, storyline game. And I'm actually going to go just a little bit about that, why, why that game has a pretty bad storyline. And say instead that this game review is course about Sega Frontier 2 instead. Sega Frontier 2. This is the best um, storyline based game on PlayStation 1. And uh, the game, of course, is good in man as well, the graphics. The combat system and the game is just really really hard so and punishing and so on. It's a very hardcore type of game and uh, so I'm gonna cover all of that but I said right away then it's gonna be a lot of spoilers because like, I'm gonna go into the storyline on, on depths right but I'm gonna do it like I'm gonna start with the mechanics talking about the combats and general, general gameplay then I have to talk about some of the narrative the overlaying narrative in the game, because the overlaying narrative so kind of affects how the combats and or not the combat, but the experience points that ever like, are are working, the learning, how you improve your character and so on. So I have to talk about that, but no, but no details. And then I will give, of course, a big spoiler when I will go into the actual uh, like in the story parts, which I like to talk about. This is gonna be pretty much me talking about <laughs> some favorite memories, but it has a really good storyline. But anyway, before, because I just want to say it anyway, because a lot, a lot of people will disagree with me. I have talked about this game, and especially Sonic Gears in general, people. So I have to say why Sonic Gears sucks. <laughs> I feel I have to do that first to do, <laughs> to prove this review. But no, but really, like, Sonic Gears is a good game. Um, so you have it in front of me here, and it's a pretty good game. The combat system is kind of lacking, actually. Um, but the game has this... It's like the complexity of the storyline is just too complex. And that's why a lot of people like to say with Sonic Gears that, oh, you're an idiot, you don't understand the game map. Because it kind of makes sense that that would be your primary argument say someone is stupid. And that's why they can't agree with you on the storyline, right? Because it's so complex. Um, but the problem with Sonic Gears is that it starts out with this very, very, actually, very un unoriginal storyline, actually. Um, with how the character leaves his home village, goes to meet a friend. Come back, the village is on fire, he steals one of the enemy's mechas, it could be, you know, whatever weapon really like, so it's a mecha in this case, it could be a magical sword and so on, defeats them, meets his soulmate girl, and you know, the actual, in the beginning story, that's actually quite unoriginal actually, but also then of course, the, uh, like the, the complexity builds up in the game, so let's say you have a complexity of like 10, that could be the perfect game. <laughs> it's like the, you build up and build up and storyline and twist and everything. But Exploring it just keeps going, right? So you get to like 14, 15 or something and it's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be a big circle rope because it just keeps building up on it and it never really... I mean, yes, it saw some stuff, but not really. So this game is then Sega Frontier 2, which I would say is the best uh, you know, narrative-driven game. The best kind of overall storyline when I get PS1. It's actually kind of reversed on it. Yes. It's very down to earth. It's much more okay. So kind of classic though. So it's like a fantasy medieval time, right? But the game does it in such a good way because this game, instead of just building up this crazy complexity, it's gonna be full of characters. So it's actually very reversed on it. Because uh, Sonic is more like everything suddenly is happening at this day, but they have story background for ten thousand years ago, right? And they keep building that up into you, and it's really confusing. Uh, and so on, but it's only, uh, but it's, uh, in Sega said they have that the game is like, okay, you're here, and we're gonna follow this character's life, and when this character is too old, we're gonna play as his son instead, and then his granddaughter. So we actually kind of follow the characters, you know, how to get children and so on. So we're actually much more, I mean, if anything, what Sega does, Sega 2 does, is that it's way more, I would say, uh, you know, you can really re relate to the characters, right? It's much more relatable. Uh, it's probably that uh, if anything. So a couple of other games I also have a great storyline. Like Sekiro 2 has a great storyline. Final Fantasy games in general has a good storyline. Uh, but everyone knows about Final Fantasy games. Um, 
and so on. Breath of Fire has good storyline. There's a couple, lot of you know, really good re- role playing games to PlayStation. But this game, if anything, is a game that is most, if you ask me, most relatable. Because it really follows you, kind of normal life. You really feel that the characters are weak, so to speak, that they are not, not, not destined for greatness. They use kind of the, of course, one of, they have two main characters, but one of them is, of course, kind of destined, destined for failure, kind of, and another character is, is kind of alive. And what makes it so interesting too is that Squares really like managed to entwist, entangle the storyline. So you follow two different characters in this game, but you kind of go back and forth into the different storylines. And you can like, oh, you did something here that affects the storyline over here. So it's very interesting. And it's actually their own games, Front Mission games, I think about, also from Squaresoft, which are probably the closest one in that kind of two different storylines. And you see it from different angles and you keep playing it and so on. So for mission, Four, I guess, which I'm thinking about because three is more that you can just pick a side. So if you replay the game, you can see it from the other side. So the enemies of your friends and so on. Uh, but this game isn't at all. This is more like you have two completely separate storylines that in the end of course meet each other, but they also have this you know, sometimes they meet each other during the story. So it's a very interesting game. You play some of the characters in both snarls and so on. Um, so it's, if anything, this game is more relatable, I think, and more interesting, I feel, because it's really like. You really feel when you play with the characters. We really like, you know, yeah, this is my main character, but then you play the game for I think 42, 43 or something like that. Maybe it's more, 50 something. So I think it started like you're just under 20, you're like 62 when the game ends, so it's at least 40 years. Probably a bit more like 45 something. And uh, yeah, so you're playing at your granddaughter instead of your first character in the beginning. So that is a little spoiler there, but yeah, like that's kind of the general feel of this game, right? And I mean, it gives you a really good. Uh, uh, feel to it, of course, and I'm also complain all the stuff in the game, like the magic, so whatever it works. But if anything, I think the game, uh, the game system works that you're like in tune to the world. So if anything, if anything, if you ask me, that means makes it make me more sense. I think the game world makes a lot of sense in that world, and like the game is extremely punishing, extremely hard game. It's very punishing, and but that actually kind of makes sense well into the actual narrative. So it's like, oh, you want to use fire magic? Well, you can't because you have a fire staff. So, you know, screw you. That's kind of the feels into the narrative also goes over to the actual gameplay. And that's why when you play one of the main characters, um, the can't use magic. I'm going to call this, that's not a big spoiler because it's like a first <laughs> chapter in the game. He can't use magic at all. And that gives you a completely different gameplay now, depending on what storyline you play. And it, of course, it's very, very driven in the narrative. So I think that also that the game really really like the narrative this is one of the few games that i feel that the narrative actually really affects you when you play the game you play all the games for example Petra fire you have, you have your main character you have dragon yeah the, that affects your gameplay as well of course because that's then the main ability you have but otherwise it's kind of like yeah this guy is a strong big guy but you can actually make him fast if you use his trainer it's like eh, you know no in sega 2 instead you really have that the characters really th- I think it didn't feel like you're fighting with them as they're portrayed in the narrative. So, I mean, it's a really good game <laughs> overall. It's a really good game, but very, very hard. But I want, to, I want to start now talking about kind of the general, how the game works and so on. And then I'm going to go into kind of narrative and so on. So, no, no spoilers yet. Okay, so first I just want to talk about the graphics in the game. Because the graphics in the game, I found is, how would you say it? It's like a painting or something. It's kind of hard to explain, you know, this kind of, of graphics, I feel. Um, but, I mean, first of all, when the game was new, it had amazing graphics, really. You look at this image here, I'm going to show you a few images of the game. And so when the game was new, right, it looked amazing. Because while all the games for trying to for 3D, you know, using cutscenes, I don't say the cutscenes like fancy or bad or anything, but this game has this what I call a timeless graphics. So if there's any game that I would actually say also works as a retro game, of course why I'm talking about this game in general, right, is this game. And in graph respects, this and Legend of Mana, PlayStation 1. So Legend of Mana, I think that most of you heard about because it's the fourth game, right, in the second Edson series. Uh, but it's a pretty bad game. Like, that's not, that game is... I might actually do a review about that in, in the future, but it's not a very good game. I think it's like a 6 to 10 or something. It's an extremely... Disappointment, I guess that's the word for dis- disappointment uh, since the third game, which is one of the best games ever, right? Which I'll definitely be doing one day. It's an amazing game. Uh, but this game then, 
uh, Sega Frontier 2 instead, I would say is tenfold better than that game. But as Legend of Mana, it has this kind of timeless, this kind of like, you know, the graphics are, you're not trying to be modern, kind of, right, when you did it. They're trying to just look as a Super Nintendo game in, in a way, uh, or a Genesis game, say Genesis, but more beautiful, right, more crisp, more exact. So that's why I was a Legend of Mana, it's probably the game I would say the most crisp graphics uh, still, though, so... That, that's the actual best strategy that game. Um, so, for example, if you compare it to, for example, Sukuren games, Sukuren 2 also does it very well, where you're still playing the game from this kind of 2D, you know, angle view, right? It's kind of over the top uh, town view, as you see in almost every Super Nintendo game, right? And that's why Sukuren 2 also works extremely well today, because it still feels, it feels like you're playing a better graphic SNES game, right? And if you look at Sukuren 5, if anything, that game still has that kind of style, where 4 did it and 4 sucked, so 5 works. Like, and this game then, it's they're not really going for kind of Super Nintendo way, or the Genesis way, they're kind of going for this kind of weird painting style instead in uh, in Sega 2 here. And it's really it's kind of hard to even describe the game, but generally it looks really beautiful if you ask me. It just has this kind of, this kind of water coil, color painting. My, my grandfather was... Uh, an artist uh, and a teacher, it's a better teacher, but he was an artist and did a lot of painting, a lot of painting from my grandfather and so on. And when I play this game, it definitely reminds me of my, my grandfather's painting because I did a, he did a lot of like landscape, landscape paintings and so on. And this game has these very beautiful landscapes and it really feels like the, the places are live and so on. And uh, really, what I mean is that if anything, uh, except this story, of course, story is always really good. This game really lives, for me at least, in a way that I, I played this game more than 10 times and not very recently I played a full game. I played a little before this review run, but like the full playthrough of the game maybe it was like a half a year ago or so for me, the latest. And I still feel that the game is completely playable on graphics, right? What if I play like 5 7 or something, they are squares. <laughs> they look like ugly polygon squares, right? So this game definitely has a very good strength, if you ask me on that. I will still give this game like a 9 out of 10 in graphics, where I will give Legend of Mana a 10 out of 10. But then I will give Legend of Mana like a 5 or something in the rest. So <laughs> this game beats the game a lot. And first of all, I mentioned that before I go into kind of the game mechanics, um, that I think the game overall looks very, very nice still. And, and, that, and that's actually, as a retro... I wouldn't call myself necessarily a retro gamer. I play all kind of games, like modern games, I play competitive games, and I also play... I also play a lot of retro games and like some, you know, and so on. But this game is one of those really good games. You can you can play today. You feel yeah, it's, it kind of works. Same likewise if you play Second Three Super Nintendo, that game really works still uh, because it have that kind of really nice sprite graphic, right? Um, so that's definitely a strength though. If you do a game today, and I think that I won't talk about this too much in this review here, but I just want to mention that. Kind of when you look back to games doing being you know done today, some of the games that I think people can play in ten years from now are probably more of the two D games still, right? Or like the sprite dust kind of games. It looks really really good today. They're very kind of perfected more than games that are just trying to be the best it can be in three D, and then in like two years they have a better game in three D. Um, so that, that's definitely a strength of this game. Okay, so first I have to talk about uh, the attunement of the world. And this is where the narrative really kind of gets into how the combat system works in the game. It's, it's very, very intriguing. So d depending on where you are in the world, you can use the elements around you uh, as a magic funeral or whatever you're going to call it. Right? And this is because every person in the world, and animals I think it's in the game, uh, are, have this thing called anima, which I think is called anima. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and so the anima you have then makes you be, you know, being able to use kind of like you can s like summon or invoke the s your surroundings. This actually makes the game very, very differently depending on where you are in the game because the game is very, very limited. It's kind of cover studio. But so if you are in a forest, you can use a wood element because yeah, there's a lot of trees there in the wood. If you are at the water, like a beach or in a boat, you can use a water element, you know, whatever, right? And if you're in the mountain, you can use stone, etc., etc. 
And this is actually very, very important for the game. Um, because you're very, very limited now. And this is typical of the, the, for example, the, the Saga franchise, which is kind of known as the more hardcore franchise compared to Final Fantasy, because they are you know, very mainstream. Right? So the game is very, very punishable, as I mentioned several times. And also in my first talk about Yapogis, because you have a very limited number of uses of everything. So for example, if you have like this, uh, it's called a fire amulet or something, it has like 20 durability, you can use that 20 times then, and that's it. If you use it more than that, it breaks, and you will be able to repair some stuff, not all stuff, but some stuff, but only in specific towns that you can't go back to because the game is very, it's not, I'll talk about narrative soon, but I guess the first point of the game is like it's, it's linear, but not completely linear. It's like a, it's more like a, like a tree, you know, like a, like a narrative tree where you start in the top, right, and then you go down, and you have different kind of like uh, options. So you can return to a, for a village you've been in before if you pick the right option, but you can't just say, "Oh, I go to the world map and go to village." You have to actually be like, well, on this chapter 5, I can return to this village by leaving this here and here. So then you can fix some stuff. You can fix all the stuff. And uh, not only does this actually kind of, you know, depend on what you can do. So if you're in the first chapter, in the, this uh, ancient ruins, I think you have water there and stone. And then in the next chapter, you might be in the forest, then you can use the wood magic instead. So some characters who couldn't help you before with wood magic cannot use that. And all the cat that was really good with this kind of stone beast ability can't use it anymore because there's no stone there, so you have to use beast wood instead. And it actually depends on you how you have to actually beat like, the enemies and so on, depending on where you are, even with the same characters. It actually affects the game a lot. And the thing is that the weapons use the same system, but they are not as limited. So you have a have a sword, it can have like 40 and durability. It means you can use four attacks, you know, it's very, very, it's quite simple. Uh, however, some higher bit actually cost more, if I'm going correctly, so they, they burn more durability, but generally it burns like once per ability. And this is very important when you get into the duels of the game. So the game has three different battle systems, and we can see it in order to play as well. And uh, so the game has the typical party, where you are four characters, uh, or, or less, right? But you have four usually on one of the, one of the main storylines. There's two different storylines, right? And on one of them, you usually have uh, four characters. It's hand perfect. Four characters, and then you might have a fifth one, and maybe then two more. Uh, but it's very rare in the game because the game is how would I explain it? It doesn't even give much options. So it's like you, you in some story parts you have more than four characters. Usually you don't. And but you, you you have to six I think at the most seven ones maybe you like, like six at usually at the most and uh, then you can of course swap characters as in most role playing games um, and then you have the dual thing and this dual thing is that one character fights either like a random enemy you face or a boss or something and the game even give you options sometimes like do you want to face this boss with like the main character or like one of the characters you can pick. Or you do it in the party, right? And then the boss, of course, summon more like friends, and the boss has more abilities and have much more health and so on. So you have the option sometimes, and then there are some chapters in the game which are completely just a single play, a single character, a single play, a single character storyline. So every fight is in the duel. Uh, however, the game actually a few times, especially in the beginning of the one of the main story, the Gustavo storyline, has just one character. But it's still party, so you fight like three, four characters with him alone. I don't know why it does it a few times, but it's there's, there's an other kind of you know uh, challenge then because of course the game is very very easy to die in. So I'm gonna. I mean the game is the hardest game ever, but it's very very punishable. You can do some. The game has the thing that pretty much all the Sega game has. That if you do something wrong in the beginning of the game, kind of that kind of punish you in the rest of the game. Right? So it's, <laughs> that's kind of that's very punishable in, in that all sense. Um, so the dual thing then is the most interesting. The important thing is pretty much like most role-playing games. Um, however, you, you do you do learn new abilities in party uh, by just if you use a lot of like spear special abilities, you might learn a new one. 
you get this light bulb over your head and you learn a new one. It's the same in like a limit, say, yeah, in Minestral Song and like the other Sega as well. You can like randomize new things. That is also, of course, actually one of the hard things with the game because the game is very linear, but also not really. But the game is very interesting linear because while the game isn't like linear in the sense that you actually have like a lot of options in the game, a lot of story parts, you can decide the order, and it's actually it's not linear. It's the slightest if you if you argue for like the options, but it's it's like a carrot linear thing. And that's why the game is so hard in the end of the game because in the narrative you're gonna pick characters, and then that character is never gonna be in the game anymore. You're gonna pick this character and say, oh, I wanna follow this character's storyline. You play this character for like three chapters, and then that character is like, well, now he's out. But he's still in his storyline. He makes like a lord or a king or something that you collaborate with or helps to give you advice or something. And it's like, oh, do you want to hear my backstory, right? And you <laughs> play that his backstory. And then he's out of the game, like a playable character. So it's really like, well, like there's no point grinding that character up, learning new stuff or whatever. Um, because, you know, you, you can't play the character anyway in the next chapter. So it's very like, it's kind of hard. This game is really hard. Is from that alone that you you're losing characters. Like the, I call it usually, I call it like the narrative by death, or like the you know perma death by narrative, where characters are just gonna like, get cut off. And for certain, it's not like typical oh main character died here or something, or like one of these characters. But this game has a lot. This game has like thirty five or so thirty something uh, playable characters. But in the end, you're only gonna have six characters. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna spoil how you, in this part, but. Still important to use to kind of note, you know, how that kind of works in the game, where you have this kind of like, well, you start out here, and uh, you know, and then the end of the game, you you actually have like none of the first characters left, <laughs> right? Because as I mentioned, the game goes by age, so if you're wanting, the characters are too old to fight anymore in the game. We even have that pretty early in the game, and my character tells you that, oh, you know, I'm too tired to like be an adventurer anymore. I'm like 45 now. I'm gonna retire, and then he, he leaves, and he never returns, like, he, I think he's a quest giver in the game, like, 10 hours later, something like that, but he like, never returns to a playable character. So you play this character for, like, maybe 10 first hours in the game, and then he's never, it's playable again, right? <laughs> so you have this kind of, like, the, not kind of not that it dies, but you still lose them permanently. So I call it the permanent death, uh, permanent, permanent, permanent death by narrative. And you have no option to save them, so to speak, you can't, like, talk them out of it. Uh, there are options in the game though that affects what character you have, what character dies or not. So the game is not just this linear path that you can't do anything about it. You actually can decide what character will die and so on. Not all of them, but a few of them. Um, but still, right? So you, will, you will lose like 80-90% of the characters sooner or later in the game. Just by playing the game. Because every every chapter in the game is like one year. Or you know every like, mission in the game is like one year or half year or something like that. So you will, you know... The characters will be basically be faded out, uh, regardless. Uh, but the dual thing then is is very interesting because it kind of combines what you learn in the duels primarily. Because what you learn in the party fighting will also be for everyone. So if one character learns like slice and dice ability, that then you can like equip that ability to anyone. That's a sword. So you can actually it's very important. That's one of the big thing in the games. It's very important actually to kind of grind as much as you can in one way in the beginning of the game so the later characters kind of start with the better abilities because all the characters have unlocked them. Um, but the dual thing then, the dual thing gives you this option how to um, pick abilities. You pick abilities, you pick like, um, how do I explain it? You have, you have four uh, slots to to fill and each weapon in the game has like 10 or so abilities. And uh, you put one of them into the slot, right? And depending on the order, you get a different ability. And here we have a very complexity of the game. Huge complexity. So first of all, back to that tombment thing. If you're in the forest, you have like wood and you have some other like, you know, nature abilities that you can fill into the slots. But you can't do it if you're not in the forest, except if you have like a wooden amulet or wooden item, right? That gives you wood magic. Or else you can't do it. So, uh, right from there, it's actually quite interesting and quite like it can be a much harder duel fight if you're not in the right area of the game because, or you can do beast magic. Beast magic, spoiler, but like, <laughs> spoiler, but beast magic is definitely the best magic for duels. So, that's kind of like if you don't have beast magic, 
So you should not have anything about nature because they don't about nature. Uh, but yeah, that, that can really affect you. Or it's more that, well, or this chapter is so hard. Last chapter I had water, fire, stone. This chapter I only have fire, so now I can't use half my magic except I could rearrange my uh, my parties and so on. That can also be a thing. Um, so that definitely affects you how you how you play the game, so where, where you are in the story. So as I mentioned again, I think it's really interesting how the story definitely seeps into the gameplay of the game. Um, and but anyway, when you do the dual thing, you pick four things and then you combine stuff. So there's a lot of like I think every weapon has like ten more than ten, like fifteen something abilities. And you do them by, for example, if you want to use like an, the bow weapon, you just like you focus, 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 or aim, like aim, aim, aim. I think focus, aim is some different things. <laughs> but yeah, you do like aim, 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 three aims, and then like shot, normal like arrow shot, and then man becomes like you know deadly focus shot or something. And then you learn that ability sometimes. So first of all, you have to like not not have no though, but you have to try out every every combo, uh, and uh, if you do it enough times with that particular order of uh, items, you actually get a new ability that will do way more damage, right? And then you can actually equip the ability into your party. So, and all, 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 and all the characters we also know when you play them in later chapters. And as I mentioned, also you have to play two main storylines, right? So if you swap between the other characters, you will know what the other characters learned. So that, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the grinding you have. You can actually evolve your strength by learning and so on. Uh, but overall, yeah, that makes it really complicated because you have to like sit there and try every damn ability. And, I, I, and as an advice in this game, it's much easier to actually play the Jewish game in the beginning and do it a lot so you can unlock pretty much all abilities because it's much harder to unlock them by random. You, you, of course, you can use a guide, as I mentioned in my first video. This game is very guide friendly because in guide you can tell exactly what to do. Uh, but most of them are actually kind of intuitive. Uh, and uh, but the later ones are harder, and you need to have I think a specific like level of your weapon to use them and so on. Um, but not only is the game limiting on this kind of like, hard thing, it's also that if you have like a fire emblem like, with ten in durability, each time you use fire as one of those items, it costs one durability. So you can actually only do it very very limited, whereas the item breaks and. Like you can't go back and repair stuff and so on, because the game gives you different options in in the story, right? But you can't. The game isn't linear in the sense that you can't uh, decide order and as a man, as a character can die and you decide and so on. But it's like the game will only let you go back to certain villages or something if you decide to do that, or even certain chapters, and then you can repair. So it's really complicated sometimes to get stuff, and sometimes and also a lot of items can't actually be repaired. Weapons and so on as well. So you're limited to having the right weapon. Actually, that's kind of just in the game because you can find these really good weapons and you actually will break them sooner or later and then you, but whatever. And if you break them, you can never repair them. Sometimes you don't around like a weapon that's like one durability left. <laughs> just hoping you will get back to something and you can fix them uh, and so on. And actually, that's one of the part of the main storyline. Uh, the one of the main characters, Will, then. You have two different main characters, Gustav and Will. Will's main storyline in general, before I get the spoiler part, the main story of him is that he's like a digger and they hunt this kind of like uh, like magical something, I, uh, amulet, rings, whatever, that like is imbued so strongly with the elements that you can use them, you know, you can use them how much you want. And they usually have one or two elements. So in the beginning of the game, he will find this beast. I think it's Beast 3, and then you can use the Beast 3 magic with him infinitely pretty much. That's a major thing in the storyline, so that he has that. And uh, it's also one of the, you will find more of those and so on in, in, you know, in the storyline, and that gives you more options, so to speak, and, uh, and so on. But the other elements, and then you also have weapons, like a staff, it's like a wooden staff, it gives you wood magic anyway, and so on. Um, so how the game works in general is that you have your six different elements, and you have six different weapons, or well, one is martial art unarmed, and five weapons, and you learn by doing. It's a typical thing that if you fight a lot with a sword, you get more sword levels, so you want to like, hit people with the sword and get more. If you use a lot of water magic, you get more water. And of course, if you use like this combination of magics, because magics are very combo friendly. It reminds you of a lot of other role-playing games, so you can like, combine 
grass and fire then you get this spell right so it's a lot of these kind of combinations then that will give you both of those spells so what you have if you combine spells is it boosts both of them right so we, we can see here that on, on Kelvin, uh, that's the main character's uh, best friend. You have, as I mentioned, the martial art that no one has used as Gustave. You have the sword, you have the axe, you have the staff, which is kind of like, like... Staffs are useless on the level of them, kind of. You have the axe, you have the bow. So I can say staff right away are, as I mentioned, staff gives you... Like you can have mad... Staffs are more magical, right? So you can have a fire staff... Then you can use the beard on it to use fire magic pretty much. If you look at Kelvin here, he has the wood spear, so that will give him wood magic on that. You have the stone knife, which is stone, and then he has different like armor. They will give him much. But the armor otherwise usually have different amulets, so on that gives you a tube for that. And then in the game, you kinda have the typical elements. Uh, kinda. So you have water. I think the more more. Uh, you have water, you have fire, and you have stone, which is kind of earth, right? So that's kind of the typical elements. But the first thing you can see is tree, which I guess is kind of like a nature, and it's kind of like water and earth. But then you have sound. I think it's called tune in the game sometimes, not sound. So sound is kind of like the air element, but not really. So it's, it's actually hard to explain this, <laughs> but it's... I would say that sound is probably the useless element in the game. You rarely use sound. Doesn't do much. Uh, then you have Beast. Beast is the best for duels, and otherwise it's pretty bad. And you, you, the elements are, as I mentioned, they usually combine them. So for example, if you want to use Firestorm, you first use wood and then use fire. Because you usually have leaves around you, and then you burn the leaves. That creates a big fire, right? And that's probably the only place I feel the graphics are kind of... I don't think lacking is good for it, but it's kind of something weak on that, that, that. It could be bigger explosions, it could be bigger graphics and so on, right? Then you combine and like create more massive spells. Um, but otherwise it works pretty nice in graphics overall. Uh, otherwise I feel the graphics are kind of... While they aren't the best effects on them, as with the narrative in the game, the graphics usually are quite... Intuitive is that the word? Like they feel like they are working in the sense that they are like you burn these leaves. If you combine like beast and water, you can create this kind of like a water element attack that has like a wolf form, you know. And like you, it's like you're giving this kind of like this uh, beast spirit into the water, and then it comes alive and attacks them. Of course, it, you know it feels pretty good. Uh, but then away, just go over the elements pretty quick in the game and talk about this. Uh, the weapons, as I mentioned, are the primary weapons you have in the game that are you have staff uses, but they don't need to use the staff that much. So what you have are like sword, axe, bow, and axe, pretty much. And but the elements, but you primar primarily will use is the four first there: yeah, tree, stone, fire, water. Rarely you have the sound, rarely you have beasts, but you need beasts pretty much to survive stuff in some parts of the game. And um, so wood, it's kind of like the combination of you know, some, some offensive abilities, some defensive buffs, um, so the abilities. Stone is very defensive, uh, like buffs defensive, and also low attacks. Fire is just pure offensive, as usual. Water is, as one can guess, healing abilities. Very important to have in the game, you have to heal a lot. So water you heal, but you also have this kind of thunder abilities, which are actually strong abilities, if I remember correctly. So, in the beginning, water is very healing, and then you actually do some mass damage with, with water abilities. Sound is just kind of... I honestly, after playing the game more than 10 times, I can tell you that sound is pretty much... Yeah, it has some debuff, it has some buffs, um, low damage. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm just a noob, but I, I never thought sound does that much. Beast, however, is, at the first glance, pretty crap. But later in the game... But you have a few, like, beast, wood, at the beginning of uh, wheels on. But later on, you do get that beast is actually very, very good. And this is because in the duels, we are only playing as one character, and that character dies, so it's game over. Uh, with Beast, I think it's three Beasts, just Beast, 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 which costs you a lot of attunement, but that Beast thing is like auto-revive. So if you die, you get back into life again. And you also have like Revive, I think it's two Beasts and one Water, something like that, uh, and so on. So if you play the duels, you usually start, it's usually it's a strategy thing here, but strategy spoiler, but then you start, you start the game with like, beast, 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 if you, 
fighting a boss or something. Especially in the, in the last part of the game, you really want to use this. Yeah, so you always want to figure out uh, what spells are good and so on. And the interesting course is that not only do you have to, like, you have the limit on you because, well, you only have this item, it only has 10 durability, so you can only use like 5 spells 10 times and then you're out and you can't repair it, you can't buy a new one. You might, you can find more, of course, fire weapons and so on later in the game. But you're limited to the one you have right now, and you probably want to like learn as much as possible as you can. So all the characters later has it. And all, because you really don't know what characters are going to stay, you really don't know what characters are going to die and so on. So the game is it's like, the narrative in the game really affects how you play the game as like, the combo system. Because it's like, uh, this character might lead me, or so on. So it's, it's very, very interesting. And the game is... Uh, you can saw the last image there, but the game also has... I can. Oh, it's life points. You have life points, and you have health points in the game. Okay, the life points is when you, when you have three life points, you you die, and the game is over because if a character dies, like the narrative is dead, right? So you have to. If someone is zero, I think you die. This is the main character, then you're dead. But yeah, so zero, you're dead. So you have your health points. You use your health points. You know, you take damage, you get health points, right? But they can get life points to heal yourself to full life again, uh, and it costs. Uh, different amount of life points, cat has different amount of life and health points of course, you get more health points for taking damage and so on. So it's that already there actually makes the game very punishable because if you enter a dungeon in some new chapter and you do some battles incorrectly, right? The enemies are not the enemies are not random contours, you actually see the enemies on, on the map. And if you do this um, incorrectly then right, you lose a lot of life points. And then you're then you're screwed. That's why the team is the last boss in the game is so hard because you you have to fight like several bosses before this last boss, uh, hundreds of enemies and so on. If you do it incorrectly too much, and you save, for example, <laughs> you save after like three bosses or whatever, or I guess you skip the bosses, but you just save and so on. And then, then you're like, whoa, I only have like ten of twenty life points here. The last boss hits you for like. 300 health per attack and one life point, so you, you reach zero and you just die. <laughs> like the, the enemies can hit you on your life points and so on, so it, that that is really crazy. You also have, of course, just a mention their ability, and you have different ability between weapon points and like special points that cost fewer party abilities usually. Where in duel, it also costs that, but it more primarily burns your weapon down. And so bosses are, of course, easier to do as a duel if you have the right duel character. Some characters are very good at duels. And someone better than parties, someone more like healers and so on, so they're better at that. Uh, and of course you can actually kind of spec around your characters. Uh, with, just, with your free learning, right, to learn by doing. So they can do different stuff and so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting on this aspect. So I'm just going to show some image here on, um, like, the how it looks a little on the duel. And uh, and then I'm going to talk about more of the, the, the storyline. First... So this is not a major spoiler yet, because I can talk about the general narrative soon here. And after that, we be spoil, spoil everything for you guys, so watch out. I really, I suppose, showed it earlier. <laughs> but anyway, so here we see Will, and you have the Amber Mallet, that's typical uh, beast tree for him. You should have it in the beginning of the game, it's going to be very, very <laughs> solid, very talented. And as you can see, it has tree and beast, because it's a tree and beast amulet. And so you can like, combine the stuff. You have this life point, and see, life is on 8 or 19, but it's full health, right? So you can, you know, if that goes zero, the game is over. Uh, so it's gonna do well then, and you pick. See, so one typical ability is a tree beast ability. So I think it's like tree beast only. And the thing with the game is that it's really interesting because not only do you use, like, well, do I wanna use, like, he, he, whatever. You can combine, of course, like tree beast, tree beast, and you get two different um, wood. Beast attacks, right? Which is the same ability twice, or you could do like three, three, three beasts or something, and it's an other ability, or you can do like shards, three beast, faint, or something, it's an other ability. So it's a lot of options there. So magic is very more more you combine different abilities, uh, many abilities. We in weapons, it's more like you can see in the image, the weapons are more like oh, you combine, uh, I think they're more intuitive in that sense, they're like slash. Backslash, you know, it's more like slash cleave or like charge slash or like uh, you know charge charge throw axe something. They, they were they kind of more like combative, intuitive. I remember when you get new, I just loved that how you like 
we're thinking about how do I do this, how do I combine this, you know, how, how would be the natural way to attack um, said enemy, right? Where magic is more like figuring out what element is combined and like how much tree do I need, how much beast do I need. Weapons are more like slash, backlash, cleave, or like that the death slash and dice, or like cleave, four cleave or something. They're more intuitive, but also you have to kind of know what <laughs> actually. Uh, what you can do and so kind of they've tried a lot it's, it's game is not easy because you can see that the ability will die out and so on um, but anyway let's go to more of the narrative how the narrative works so this is where the game hit gold really if you ask me this is something that like no other game really does well and when talking about narrative this is why the game is so damn good because all the Sega games the other games in this franchise, right? They are very open world. So in for example the next game on Limit Sega, you had seven characters, but in one of the, the easy mode, whatever you call it, you had two main characters. And none of us have seven other people. And the next game, which is a remake of their first SNES game, Romancing Sega Mr. Song, you have eight characters and you pick them and so on. And those games has like bad storylines. They have crappy storylines. They're really, really best story. Some people love it because it's like, oh, it's more open world. You can do it all at once. But that is crap, if you ask me. Sure, all the games are way better. All the role-playing games. This is not the best role-playing games. Um, I'm not saying that. But the thing is that this game, like, it really, it really gives you this, uh, the perfect, the mix of per two worlds. Because with other games, like Final Fantasy primarily, Fantasy franchise to have this very linear, you know, you, you, you play the game and you get the storyline, like reading a book or like watching a movie, right? You just get the storyline, or then you already have the well, a lot of the games or whatever games or more Western RPG games that are more like, yeah, you can walk around, you can do this and this, and you can like reach different areas in your tempo and so on. But that is gives them all a much more shallow and hollow experience. This game hits kind of the perfect middle thing, really. Uh, so you see the image here. This is the first like world map in the game. This is the first image game you control the game. This is how the world well, the world map looks. Right? You don't you don't move around in the world. The game is <laughs> the game is linear in that sense. It looks like a tactical, tactical game or like FF10 or something. You know, it has the map thing really. You pick decisions. But what you do instead is that in this game you don't actually pick areas. Uh, as you can see the name here, first you have Gustav uh, Born, which is that the, the pre, the, what you see, when you start the game, you will see this, right? You will see the birth of the main character. So then you can just rewatch that by picking that one. And otherwise here then, you get the split. Either you start with Will's journey, or you start following Gustav's, um, the, the, like when he's um, teen year and so on. So, um, you have to do open shit, right? And the game really is interesting because you're, you're not picking areas here. Sure, in a way you're picking areas, where you want to go and so on, but what you're picking is a storyline instead. So it's not like the other role-playing games where you don't have a world map and you pick, oh, I want to go to the Mystic Forest. Here you said, oh, I want to follow Gustavus' life. So that will tell you when he's like training and then we go this. So Gustavus' exile there, or exile, that, that will actually cover like... I think three or four, you know, areas in the game or more. For another continent, if we, you know, and so on. And the wheels will cover like his home village and the first ruins in the game, right? So it's very much different there. Different approach to how you do it. But the thing is that this game is just a sweet combination of narrative here, because instead of playing as I mentioned, then the kind of open world and you just go around, or the very line here you have linearity, but you can decide when you want to see the storyline. So instead of having like, oh, I just want to do this, you can be like, I want to play, you know, Gustave, you like the storyline, you keep playing, you, you can play the storyline for like, I don't know, 20, 30 chapters, and then it's like over. Then you can start with the storyline. Or you can do like one each, you can do like five, and and when you do the storyline things, here we only see two of them, but when you read certain points in the storyline, this will unlock more like, you know, alternative um, main characters, or like, side plots. So for example, you will get into a bit and Gustav will meet this general and then this general will tell you about uh, you know, <laughs> like the life uh, and so on and before and then you can play that storyline for a bit. 
or um, you will meet this guy that's like an assassin and he suddenly in your suddenly he's in your main story with Slava and then you can play for a bit and you're like who's this guy he's just <laughs> in my army okay he's pretty strong he has some really good abilities and then you beat that or whatever like one or two chapters with him and then you unlock this new chapter where you we can play as this guy instead doing his own thing like his main character dual kind of thing for like an hour or two <laughs> so you have a lot of these kind of like weird you know story chapters that you can unlock and play them at your own f- f- uh, leisure or at your own face because you can unlock this assassin storyline and you can just ignore it say like, no I want to play wheel instead I want to play this instead so you actually have the the options how you wanna you know how you wanna experience the storyline do you wanna go deep into this do you wanna Play every side story and record the side character, you can learn new abilities and so on. So I will recommend playing the side storylines as much as you can because even if those characters necessarily aren't in the main story as playable characters, everything they learn, you can move into the main story with your characters. It's actually very important to grind those out. Uh, it, could, it can be, depending on how you play the game, to actually beat the game. But that can be a way to, like, I want to grind on these enemies. Um, because you can't grind enemies because they have no random encounters. It could be a way. Well, some some areas you can actually like respawn enemies, uh, which is actually recommended. But otherwise, if you don't want to like play the game and not be overly, you know, also gonna stand in one area and do it. By doing all the side quests, you can of course learn more moves and unlock move like unlock moves in general, and get some items. So some items can be transferable. In a few places in the game, you can actually get items for your characters to your current characters, so and so on. So you wanna like do that. And this also gives you, what I would say, the very Japanese way to looking at it. The very typical, uh, if you compare it to the manga or anime or something, because some of the stories actually are following the enemies as well. Which also is a really good part of the game, right? And it's, and it's not really like if you play another role-playing game and say, Oh yeah, we're doing this and we're fighting this b- evil bad guy. And then you see some cutscene, you know, where you see the bad guy talking to you like, Yes, we should do this. We maybe get some flashback about the bad guy's horrible life or something. No, no, in this game, you actually play as the main character, the evil characters. Not that much, but you have several chapters in the game where you actually become uh, like the evil guys. And you're like, yeah, you have to go and kill some people or enemies, and you, you know. And uh, not so often, but they have a few of those as well. So you can get the backstory for, the char- for some of the enemies by playing as them, which I think is really nice as well. So overall, the game is, the, the linearity of the game is. So it's an interesting way because they follow typical Japanese linearity by, you know, supplementing the story to you. So if you play like Gustave and then you get an old Gustave story and you get like 10 chapters of his life, right? So you play them very linearity. But at any time after one story is beat, you can jump into Will again, play a couple wheels, or you get like some other side characters from Gustave's life that you can watch their life instead for a bit. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting, the game. Um... It's quite an intriguing uh, system in the world, really. And I really wish more games would use this. Because not only do you have, like, the, the options of it, uh, but it also, I mean, it, it both it really combines, right, the, the options of having, well, I want to see the storyline in this order, kind of. But also it, it gives you the, the, kinda, the, 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 the good stuff of linearity. Because if you ask me, almost every really open role-playing game sucks ass on the storyline. Because you're always going to be too spread out, too weak. It's going to be too much shallowness in the actual storyline. And in this game instead, you get something much more deep into it. More silent. Of course, as I mentioned as well, you actually... Good, good, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm so going to the spoiler part. I'm going to explain more about why it's so badass. And it's really hard not to say why it's so good in how it's portrayed. But just in general, the how the storyline kind of works is is very very unique. I would say, or like in a good way, and how it unlocks stuff and so on. And you can like, see the map, and you can also, as you see, you can go back and read stuff and so on. So it gives you kind of the memories and, and of what's happened and so on, and, and how the world actually kind of is portrayed in, in the world. It also feels pretty good because it also gives you this sensation of, if you ask me at least, that the game is not. Oh, well, I'm gonna go and save the world. The game's more like, well, I'm an outcast trying to survive. I started in this country or this this continent, and now I'm in other continent in exile. As you can read, you saw it. Spoil here, and this is the first in the game. And the game doesn't have that kind of, you know, 
oh, we, let's go and save the world. It kind of reminds me of the, the Sukhodev, for example, where you like, you save your country pretty much, right? The, or your continent. And I kind of like that with a lot of role playing games. So you, you don't go into this. For example, as I mentioned, being an exoning game, where it's like, oh, save the planet from God or the evil gods or something. You know, it, 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 this is much more down to earth. However, you will kind of miss out at the end of the game. And then you can say it anyway. But it's kind of like, still, you know, it gives you more feeling. However, though, two stories are all very different. So you, you know, one is more political, one is more typical role playing game. Wills is more a typical party role playing game. Gustav is more single character political uh, drama. So it's, it has kind of the combination of both what you see in Final Fantasy game as well. Then. And as I mentioned earlier, when you do unlock this different kind of stuff and you, you do unlock the different kinds of, um, as I mentioned, parts and like you, you sit and so on, that it also you can, that's how you meet with other characters. So for example, you, you know, you will meet this character and he, and he talk to you. And then that character leaves or something like that, you know, and and says so like, oh, I have to go back to my uh, sick wife or something. But I see you in, you know, in when I can. And then the character is gone for the next chapter, but it's back in your, you know, two chapter had it back again, right? Something like that. But if you play with the other ca- main character, he will actually meet the character when he's home in his home village, and if you have him instead, then you know, so you actually have to kind of, you know, it's kind of how that works so well. So it's really nice. However, as the game isn't actually line years to the image here, you can actually build up. So you can build up the different storyline chapters and orders. What I mean by that is that, for example, if you play Gustav's storyline for like 10 chapters, and then you start playing the real storyline, right? You can be that, oh, this part of like Gustav's storyline 7 actually takes place during Wheel Storyline 5, or this side story that you unlocked with Gustavo or really, whatever, takes place in the other one. So it gives you an interesting feel to it, because you're kind of like playing the game, because the time in the game is very important, because, you know, the time, uh, you know, develops. And you can see this image here because the text down here, but uh, they also have like a timer, what year it is, um, on the side and so on, and what area and continent. So that's really important in the game, then, because you know that, oh, this year table is here, and this is this year. And so on. So you kind of built up and all the backstories and so on. Um, so overall, it makes the game very, very interesting on how the different storylines comes together. And, you know, it really gives you kind of a like special feeling that sometimes it's very, like, you know, very important part of the storyline comes together. Some other times it's like a cameo appearance. That, oh, this character is here. That's the... Or the left the character that betrayed me in their story. I'm here now, I like, kill him with this character instead of <laughs> someone, right? So you have a few of those, like, oh, whatever moments. And otherwise, you have this um, grand stream of things, especially in the end of the game, then, which I said several times. Which, but, I thought, but I don't think that's a major spoiler. I think that anyone has seen any movies where you have several different, like, main characters and they're kind of, you know, Sometimes meeting up with each other, but otherwise it usually kind of ends up something in, in the end. I, don't, I won't say how his part at all, but it kind of kind of combines them a little, to no surprise, I would say. I think that's a very given. When I played the game as a kid, the first time I was like, yeah, this two main kids one day are going to be best friends, right? Something, <laughs> something, right? That's the feeling you get, of course, when you start playing the game. Uh, otherwise, I think you're, you're kind of delusional. Um, but now I want to go into... Uh, I'm gonna stop talking about the storyline a bit. I think I, I think I hopefully have explained why this story in this game is so interesting because it combines the linearity but also with the options. So it's kind of both of the you both have the cake and you eat the cake. It's very very well done. Uh, so but now I want to go into this to give the game a review, like the, the, the score of the game. And I'm, obviously this I'm very biased, but I'm gonna go into this, give the game a review uh, score, and then I'm gonna really go into the, the meat of the story. Uh, and because I think the people that play this game, I hope they want to hear what I liked in the game. I think that when I talk to this game about people that play the game, it's really fun to discuss the, the main story parts, right? For example, with my last review of Solo Mad, I don't think that anyone really want to discuss that game on the story part. It's like, yeah, okay, they have a lot of weird stuff in it, <laughs> you know? This is a game we, I feel that it's very emotional, it's very relatable. There's really, really good twists and so on. So I'm going to talk about this stuff because I want to you know, go into the spoiler stuff on it. Um, but first, let's, let's give a review of the game. Okay, so let's talk about the score in the game. And obviously, I'm very biased. I love this game. 
Uh, obviously, every game I'm gonna cover in these kind of series are games that I like, which I already covered them. It's pretty, it's <laughs> quite obvious. Uh, but this probably is one of my absolute favorite games. Uh, for example, I took some shit on this Sonic Gears. I did have it here on my table. I mean, it's a pretty good game. Um, but the Sonic is one of the games that yeah, everyone that knows about Japanese, Japanese role-playing games has probably heard about that game. Uh, this reviews, this retro reviews are more about talking about these games, right? That I think a few people actually have played. Uh, actually, it's pretty good. There. And so you know that, that's like that's what I'm talking about primarily, right? But I really think this game is easily nine out of ten. But I'm gonna give it ten out of ten. And there are a few things that I'm gonna say that is the, uh, really bad with the game. Not really bad, but are bad. And but I'm gonna say that if this game was just today, it would not be a ten out of ten. Absolutely not. It would be a nine, maybe an eight, because it does have some you know qualities that are not welcome today to be. But the have thing about this game is really really old. This really is like a retro PlayStation One game, and at the, at its time. No, no, no of the game were user friendly and so on. So you can't really say, say that, well, this game had no tutorial. That's pretty crap. I, I don't think I'll do it. If anything, it's a nice to have a tutorial. I really don't care about tutorials in the game and so on. I think usually you learn it anyway. The problem with this game is that, for example, earlier I mentioned that you can give uh, items from characters that have died or whatever, which lets you in the story, to your new characters uh, at certain points in the game. But the game never tells you this. You have to just figure out. You talk to some guy in this town and his village, and he can do it for you. The game never says that. Oh no, you're in chapter twenty-five. You can actually go here to this guy. And he can help you with items. Like the game just tell you that, but the game doesn't. And even for that age to speak, the game should include that because you actually miss that out and so on. Uh, I did it in my first playthrough, I think, uh, or maybe I saw it in like chapter thirty-five or something. You know, or the next house in the village. Um, so for that, so that should be in the game. Um, so that would lower today, of course, because today that would be extremely unacceptable, I, w I would say. Um, but at its time, it, it's it's fine. But because you kind of shoot out everyone and so on, typical role playing game. But still, there's some issues that. Uh, the main issue of the world for the game is that the game is really hard. It's extremely punishing, as I mentioned. If you do mistakes, if you destroy an item, if you lose important item in the beginning of the game. You would never get them back. If you break something, you can repair them and then you're screwed. It's a lot of that, right? If you don't grind the specific intervals that the game you can grind, the game will be a bit impossible and so on. Um, that is, I think it's okay. Like if you want a hard game, it's a good game for you. Like this game is, this game is not stupid hard. It's just hard and I really like that. So it actually is great that it has the kind of level of where you're just like, well, I kind of deserve that. I shouldn't have done that. So you kind of you kind of have this relationship with the game where you feel that the game is very punishable, but you still have to do the mistakes yourself, right? Um, so it's it works, but it's not very user friendly. Or it's, not, it's not very like uh, in tune to it. However, the last boss is stupid hard. And that, it's a big minus for the game. It really is. Uh, the, the last boss in the game is used. I think everyone who's a guy about the game knows that the last boss is like. Hundred times harder than the second as boss something. The last boss is insanely hard, and it's really no reason for it. Like it, it could be ten times harder, and it will still be hard, right? It's just ridiculously much harder than it should be. Uh, so suddenly, I mean, the game is like a, uh, let's say, because I have played harder games than this, and I'm talking about talking about single player role playing games, not like whatever esport <laughs> tournament you could be in something. I actually have my esport shirt on here. You can see it on the camera, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Um, the EM Swedish esport. Um, like that is harder. That it's harder to play with someone and say, oh, it's like this much money on the line, um, and whatever, right? So even with lower money, uh, and so on, that's harder the tournaments. Um, I like it. You could use it, but anyway, like that's harder. Like definitely harder. But this game is probably like an eight out of ten or something. So it's not that hard. Uh, overall, it's like it's, not, it's extremely god level hard, but it, you know it's pretty hard. Uh, but it's fine. It's, it's really fine because it's not a main franchise game like Fafet something from from uh, the same company, right? So it's pretty good level on it. However, though, as I mentioned again, then the last boss kind of goes from like maybe the boss is of seven out of ten or something, and then that boss is like eighty out of ten. It's like what the fuck? What happened here? It's like this. This is impossible. So you have to kind of grind your way, and you can grind and get stuff and so on. Actually, early in the game. Uh, until you get to the last dungeon, so you have to kind of prepare for that. 
for like 40 hours earlier or something. It's like 20 so hours to beat the game. I think it was good at the game. But yeah, so it's it's, 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 really, it's really weird. And that does give it a big, it give it a, a minus, definitely. Um, also, one thing I think the game should be better uh, because of the freshness of the character, especially in the middle of the game, is that uh, well, like when the characters, like you get a new party of characters, should speak, uh, it happens more frequently at part of the game. Then the game could be like, well, you just got these new characters. So if the last enemies were, let's say the last enemies were like level 30, then in this new chapter, the enemies can be like level 30 again, I guess. But then, because you know, you get new characters with new abilities and like they're weaker than the last characters. So you want this next chapter to be harder, right? You want the next part of the game to be a little harder than the last chapter, but not so much. Or maybe you want to have a threshold, but you know, you want to have the game like a little harder. Uh, so the same level would actually be kind of harder because you certainly have new characters which are weaker than the last characters and they, you have, they have their abilities, you can give them their like their moves unlocked but they have uh, pro probably worse items on and it could be in the part of the game where like, you, you suddenly start in a dungeon or force and you can't actually like, recoup them so you have a much worse situation uh, but the game doesn't do it, the game tells you that well the last enemy is for level 30 uh, so this enemy is 35 and you have just a worse team so it, you know, it becomes like a double difficulty height, right? Both reducing all of your stats and increasing all the enemy stats. Suddenly you go from like a challenge of like 7 to like a 9, right? In this chapter, a 10. And then you beat that chapter and then you get like to know this character better. And maybe you can go and shop or something and then it actually goes down again. So it's, <laughs> yes, that was kind of part in the game. Yes, I don't remember one part particularly in my, med in my mind because I'm like talking about more than the spoiler parts. Uh, I, can't, I can't mention it here because that's story spoiler, but definitely it's like, what the fuck happened? No, the game is like twice as much, twice harder, because suddenly you like, you complete a new team and so on, and it's just like really, really weird how the game just keeps, you know, increasing the difficulty, uh, as with no regard to your <laughs> shared strength and levels. Because literally, you can be how strong you want in this, like, chapter 20, but 21, you get four new party members completely, from the, the former ones, so it doesn't matter how strong you were the last chapter, you will be on like, you know, this level of strength to speak, uh, regardless, right? So you should, you should like a, set that level of that dungeon to that level, to that difficulty. And that gives you the, the weird, and that, that's, I feel that it can, it can be a little smoother than that. But it's not impossible, it's the last boss, but it's crazy possible. but otherwise it's not impossible at all. You can still beat it though, so it's not, it's not a big minus, in, in the end, because you see, it's like you can see the challenge, you can understand how to beat the enemy, you can still use the kind of the same strategies by you know, inventing new moves or setting in and so on. So, you should be able to beat it. Um, but you do die in the game every now and then and so on, which I think is good though, because other Roper games so on, are way, way too easy, right? You can just play the game from beginning to the end and never really feel the challenge because you can see the enemies with so whatever you do, so then you never die. This game doesn't do that. This game, you will die. Uh, every now and then and so on, uh, the first time, so it's, uh, it's pretty good. I mean, if anything, as of me, this playing all these role-playing games, that really increases my enjoyment of the game, actually. That I feel that, you know, this is pretty hard. Actually, like, for step in now, I'm playing Pokemon Moon, uh, about, about the Moon one, uh, as a side game right now, and, like, that game is not particularly hard, fortunately, I think it could be harder, so as Pokemon, but it still feels like, you know, you, you, you lose sometimes, you keep going, with this, uh, the totem, so, you know, that feels pretty good. I'm, I rather want to lose a lot, so I feel that I have to invest and think about it and so on. Um, but obviously that game is like, <laughs> compared to this game, it's not even close. <laughs> this game is extremely punishable. Um, um, but anyway, so it's like covering the game. I think that, as I mentioned in the beginning, the graphics are amazing. The graphics are very landscape painting. That's the closest word I come, uh, I come up with it. And the thing with the game is that it, it still works. I can still play it on my, on my TV right next to me here, and it would still be fine. I still feel that the graphics are wonderful, right? It, it, it works so, so nicely. And so the graphics are 10 out of 10, 9.5 9 out of 10, because it's one game that I mentioned earlier, it's Legend of Mana, that I would give a better graphics. This is like the second best place in gaming graphics, two role-playing games. And it's, it's just, it stays there, it's just so good. Uh, and the music, I haven't mentioned the music yet, but the music is overall great. It's not the best they have ever done, uh, but you definitely feel some similarities to like Final Fantasy and so on, you know. There's some other different kind of themes with it, so you've, it's not exactly the same, but you feel some recognition to it. 
Uh, overall, it's good. It's like 8, 7 out of 10. There's a few uh, teams that are really, really good. Like the Gustavo's main team, team of Flynn is really good. Some of the bad teams are really good. Um, so overall, it just uh, it works. And that's probably like, uh, the weakest part in the game, actually, the music. I mean, the music is good, but it's not fantastic. It's not, it's not on the level of like Final Fantasy VII or something. Like It's more like, you know, you know yeah, okay, it has uh, great music, but not the best music. Probably actually the weakest part of the game. Even though it's some of the tunes I listen to probably an hour a week or something. <laughs> no, but like I listen to some of them over an hour again. Um, but it's pretty solid. It's just solid music part. Uh, of course, the shadows of the game is it's really good. The last boss definitely demands it. So it's like, I would say the shadows difficulty of the game is like a 9 out of 10. Because of the last boss, particularly the last boss, it just breaks. It's just like, they drop the ball on that one. And I'll drop something. <laughs> and also, I just dropped something myself in real life. That's very nice. Um, but also, um, as I mentioned, like the, sometimes when you move into all the chapters and so on, depending on how the story forces you into it, that feels kind of weird when you when you get into that. It also kind of drops it down a little bit. But otherwise, the game is really good because the game is punishable like hell, but it's your fault. You're never thinking like, oh, uh, I locked out and the boss was easy or... It's never like... Um, so not platform games where you like you jump into this you know big area and you can't see the ground in the next screen of the game and yet you just know that they have to fly like this to not die but if you just fall like this you will die I and mean, you can't see it before it's like a black group or something you know some platform games kind of give you that right when you kind of drop into that this can not do it at all it will give you a really hard challenge but it's straight in your face you know what to do when this boss is really hard and so on Actually, if anything, the other Sega games, like a Limit Sega, next game, in fact, has it worse than that. Like, suddenly this boss drops in and it's like 10 times harder than the last boss. And this happens 7 times in that game. Here's just the last boss that's like 100 times harder, but the other bosses are generally 2 times or so harder. So they're not like ridiculously stupid harder, suddenly. Um, so that's pretty good. Of course, the control or whatever is is perfect. Um, it's turn based. Uh, actually, the dual thing, as I mentioned, works pretty well. Like, you you remember how to do all stuff and so on, and you have to think about it as a puzzle, kind of, in a way, and so on. So, overall, you know, the game is, uh, of course, with the amazing story, it really works. So, I, I, I would give it, give it 10 out of 10 uh, as a retro review, though, because there are a few things I mentioned, nothing too difficult, but also, like, the game never gives you any tutorial, uh, it never gives you any advice on stuff to characters or. The game couldn't tell you that, well, character X is gonna die in three hours, so you probably shouldn't level this character. That would really ruin the experience, but it's kind of like, um, you know, the first time you play the game, the, the storyline is so impactful, so you're like, oh my god, it happened, and it, it was great, I can't tell you that. But in a way, the game maybe should have, like, given you some kind of advice on that. And I, I, I can't say how you should do it, I, I honestly haven't figured out I know my own design for that, but... It's kind of like, uh, maybe the game you should have the easier could give items or, or whatever, or you should transfer skills or something, a little maybe, or like some value of this character could be into next value or, or whatever, I don't, I don't know really, but like, the game is a little hard on that, uh, and also of course, as I mentioned, it, just, it doesn't ever warn you of anything, right? it just happens to you. Of course, that makes the story even better because you have no idea what's going to happen. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it has to be good with the bad. But I think for a retro game, it's definitely 10 out of 10. But if it was released today to Steam or something, it would be like 9 out of 10 um, because it has a couple of issues then, uh, how it's portrayed and so on. Uh, anyway, now I'm going to go into this massive spoiler, okay? I'm going to go into this huge spoiler. I'm talking about the characters. Uh, why I like this game so much and it's kind of like when you review any movies or whatever I talk to a few friends and you really feel like this is so good so I have to tell you why it's so good by, but when I tell you why it's so good it will ruin it for you so I'm going to say it right away if you, if you actually want to play this game and you're sitting here me ranting about the actually thing of playing this game you should not listen to me talking about this point I'm, I'm going to talk about I'm going to drop the, the ball and just, I'm just going to say everything I'm, I'm, I'm uncovering Pretty much all of the major story portion of the game. I'm not going to detail so much, but I'm covering all of it. What what's going to happen and so on, and why it's so good. Because I want to talk about, especially as a game designer myself and so on, I want to talk about why this game is so impactful and why playing this game really has given me like an idea of what I 
you know, written my own storylines or done some games and so on. I actually think this game, some of the games I really think back to um, from my youth and be like, yeah, that was a good game experience. How can I do this today, right? So this game is really, really good. Uh, so I really want to cover that, all the good parts with it. Um, but I'm going to be like, spoiler cut here. I'm going to be like, stop, do not, <laughs> do not follow after this minute. So I'm going to do this clear cut here and then put the camera or whatever. And so you, you will see me in another kind of angle. There will be mega spoilers because I'm going to be covering all of the basics of the game. Uh, so uh, yeah, spoiler here from out. So you can see now I even changed my shirt. Shit piece with the camera, so really going into the spoiler territory right now, and I mean massive spoilers. Uh, so I'm gonna covering, I'm gonna cover my favorite points in the storyline, and just generally why stories are good and so on. And why I'm doing this is several reasons. I think the people that play this game, they like to you know discuss it here, or people have their what they liked and so on. It's kind of the general uh, perspective I have when talking to people that have watched or read or whatever the same media that you have. You wanna get to that aspect. But also, it's kind of like so hard to sell in anyone to do anything without giving them the, the spoilers. And what I mean primarily is the twist, right? So, for example, I remember once my cousin served me to watch uh, Old Boy, which is a Korean thriller. And he was talking to me for like maybe 10 minutes or so, and I was listening to him, and you know, he made some valid points about that movie and all of those uh, revenge tr the, the trilogy. trilogy. And I was like, yeah, but it sounds, eh, it sounds okay, right? But it was like, well, this could happen in the end. And he just, you know, he just blurted out and spoiled the whole movie for me. And, but he was right. And he told me right away, you're not going to watch this movie if I don't tell you the twist in the end. The twist in the end is you, can, you don't expect it and so on. So if I don't tell you the twist, you won't watch the movie. So now I kind of ruin the movie for you. But otherwise, you probably wouldn't have seen it at all, right? So it, that's kind of definitely... If any good storyline, usually, like a really good storyline, it's hard to um, persuade someone without giving them, like, oh, it's kind of like this series, but better, I guess. So, you know, you kind of have to be like, you know, we really want to go into, like, the, the major plot lines, which is really, really hard um, to sell it. And a game like this, it has a lot of twists, uh, a lot of, like, sad, emotional part of the game. It's a very sad game in, in a lot of ways. It's not very, yeah, it's not very comedic. You know, it's, Quite dramatic game, right? It's a lot of political drama and so on. Um, it's very, as I mentioned earlier, the game really starts out well, I think, because it really gives you this main character, Gustavo, that's really like a loser. You really relate to this kind of outcast, you know. You're definitely not playing this destined child for greatness. You're playing, as I mentioned way back, you're playing the character that's destined for failure. And that's why you get expelled, and it's really, it's really interesting. Well, excited, I mean, excited, but it's really interesting how the game puts you in this absolutely misery, kind of. And it doesn't kind of makes it better for you, um, then it twists you like that. So, it, it, the game is it's just such a good storyline. And as I mentioned, the game even gives you, like, oh, you're playing as a bad guy, but the game this is one I love this, it's kind of called Sargon. Um, Tigrex, Sorgon, and Sauron, and you liked in the um, Lord of Rings one. I think the name is Sargon, or if I remember correctly now in English, in, in Persian. But then, anyway, when you play him, you, you don't know he's evil. You don't actually know you're playing the evil character, but in the end, like you kill your friends, and it's like, oh, you're evil. <laughs> so it's like, it even gives you that kind of, emo that kind of emotional bit where you're playing in the game, and you're like, you're playing this uh, like a way back old dungeon in the game and in the end of the game uh, or this the chapter or the storyline you you get this kind of try system and you have to like you, you kind of flashes around and then you wake up and then you have murdered your two best friends or whatever like your two pupils and then there's the main evil because it's like ah you did it you were the strongest of them so you're gonna join me now and you're like what the fuck i'm evil <laughs> you didn't even know you were evil it's like what this is how this kind of evil is it's a boss it's the second hard boss in the game later on so it's like that's really interesting the game also does that. The game is really good with this. So first and foremost in the game, and which I found love about the game. So I imagine that you have the anima, so you have the that's the characters, everyone in the world, every animal can um, you know, attune themselves to the surroundings and use magic depending on where you are in the world. So for example, where I am right now here in Sweden, I would probably have like forest, <laughs> I guess. 
Så det är som Young eller vad som helst. Det är en typ Force of Order. En av Force of Order. Så det är en ny typ av Resident Area. Exactly right here now. This is probably like a Force of Human. Because it's a lot of woods around here. Because uh, I live a little on the outskirts of the city. Um, it takes me like 10 minutes to get into the, the city center. But as I said in Sweden it's a lot of forest. So yeah. So probably have wood ability here. Um, if I go 20 minutes for that direction, I probably get water, you know. So it's kind of like Pokemon Go. <laughs> you go to the area and get the abilities. Um, but the main character in Gustave, which I think most people will agree agree is the main character. You have two different as two different storylines, uh, which are very different. But Gustave is kind of the political drama that drives the world, where Will is giving you the typical party, the the more relationship to Fans love children. He gives the more typical, like this long given drama, where your service giving you this political drama that's completely different. Um, so it's really hard to say who's the main character. The most people think Gustav is the main character, kind of the beginning of the game, but the game kind of ends with Will being the main character in the end. That's a twist in itself almost, that you kind of like feel that, well, this character of these two is the main character, but at the end of the game, actually. The other one was the main character because he was the one that kind of finished it, the kind of and he's the real protagonist in a way, right? Uh, so very interesting. So two, two different protagonists. And uh, but anyway, then let's really start with that because I think the game. I would say that it kind of feels like you could play the game for like the first five or so hours with Gustave, uh, and you see his whole storyline pretty much, and then you can start to build. It's kind of like how. I would say it's the easiest way to do it. It's not the correct way to do it. I think you should do like every second or so chapter, like going back and forth, because that's then their time lights are kind of you know on the same time. If you do all of the Gustavo storyline, you will actually kind of miss out on some of the uh, like the, in the intervening part, like Tyler is going to be in the Gustavo storyline, for example. He's one of the good friends of Will, um, so that's kind of like uh, a little weird, but still. Because I want to you know, get to the storyline, and this is when the real spoiler right? Because obviously, even I played this game, they were talking about Gustave. Then um, he has he has no he has no magic, right? He is pretty much useless, and this is really where the game can start you off with his life. You start with his born, you, you you see his father, the king of or well, also I don't remember the country, but it's a made up country, you know, European, and uh, you know he's exalted. He, his uh, first son is born, so he returns from the battlefield because he's a mighty kingdom, right? Uh, or empire, or whatever. And you know, they have children, and then you follow, you know, you, you, you're growing up, so you follow kind of the, the general storyline of, you know, growing up, training some martial art, training some sword fencing, whatever. You have the typical prince life. However, everyone in this world has magic, right? Of course, different levels, but you can like attune yourself to the element I thought about. And they have this weapon called a firebrand, I think. <laughs> also around it's like fire sword something. It's like firebrand, like the enemy, it's like uh, Ghost and Goblin and Wheel, I think it's called it actually. But it's very similar. And it's a magical fire sword. And this is like one of the quills that the wheelie touches for. Uh, as I mentioned a little earlier here, I touched on that a little, but you also have you have items in the world that are internally attuned to something, so you can use infinite number of it. So this sword then is internally fire, so you can fight with it, and it gives you, you know, infinity fire attunement, so to speak. You can never run out of that fire death sword. So it's like this absolutely royal weapon, right? And his, your, your like your uh, mentor, your trainer, is have a, you have a couple of sleep with him and your mother and so on, and they kind of figure out that you can't use magic, and then on your, your crowning when you're gonna be at the the, the, the crown prince, we have to do this ritual with the sword that you walk into this big like, church and you're gonna use this all of the dome. You're gonna like lift up the sword and like light it with fire in front of all these bishops and, and so on. He can't do it because he has no uh, he has no attunement of the magic at all. So you fail that. You get, this is just like a cutscene to be. You fail that and then you get exiled. And, um, and then you get, you know, thrown out. Uh, of the counter. I think you're, the story is kind of vague on it. Are you actually going to execute it? But your mother and like the mentors are going to have to escape ish. So you, it's kind of like your father is kind of like if he's going to kill you or not. And your mother is kind of with you because she's like, no, I'm going to leave my son, you know, to grow up somewhere else alone and so on. So you, you kind of run away. Um, 
from your um, the whole pretty much all continent almost uh, your, your storyline and so and then you know you grew up with as Gustave and the game is just really really interesting because that storyline is kind of you know that, that's not the original storyline itself but the thing is that it's often to do it exiled for whatever reason you get into a situation where you're playing this main character and you have no magic so it's actually every other character that you you're gonna have in your team as Gustave like, can use magic but you can't. So you, you, it's the worst character. He's a shitty character that, that he can fight. And he's like, the only character you get is martial art pretty much. And, and so on. And everyone, I mean, the, the game really is sad in the beginning. The game really is sad. Like, you, you, you play this character that everyone bullies, everyone makes fun of. You're, you're useless, you know, you're l- less alive than a rock and so on. You know, you, you, everyone hates you pretty much. And he's gonna understand, but the story is really interesting because you start to understand that steel, like the metal steel, like it uh, kind of diffuses, it kind of deflects magic, how you say it. Like steel, if you were, if you wear like a steel sword or a steel armor, especially with armor, you can't use magic because it kind of like I don't know closes off your anima or something. So it's like lead for Superman or something. So if you have steel on you. You're kind of immune to magic, but you can't use magic yourself. And this is actually, as I mentioned earlier, but I didn't want to say it because it was spoiled too much. Or kind of, that actually is a story part in the game that invokes into the gameplay, right? Because if you play the real storyline, you will also find steel with him. And if you keep him with steel, he can't use magic pretty much. He can, but he's way weaker. But it gives you way more defense, right? So you actually have that kind of gameplay all the time. But Gustav, that interesting enough, of course, actually turned out to be the best character in the game. Him or Gustav, I guess, because Gustav becomes pretty much magic immune in a part in the story that because he's wearing this like steel armor or has his own steel weapon and so on, and that makes you pretty much be immune to all the enemies' magic while you do really, really high physical damage. So you have like no option with him, but he's immune to everything they can do. So he actually, it's really, really good. So he kind of, you know, finds the like he has this disease pretty much, and he finds a way to use it to actually make him stronger than everyone else. So obviously, it's, you know, it's not all over nothing. But actually, this the game is so interesting how they portray the narrative because this isn't like oh he discovered the secret of being having no animal and it's best. You're actually gonna have a lot of chapters in the story in the beginning where he goes to this uh, to this smith and you know to go to this like uh, and makes his own weapon and you're gonna play the game and you know you're gonna like watch the game kind of cuts into the beginning of the game, you stand there hammering on this steel metal, crafting that weapon. So in the game storyline, you get a better, better weapon because you're going back to your your personal um, smite and like, you know, hammering on your weapon every in between the chapters pretty much. So the game really goes over the years, right? The game, as I mentioned several, earlier several times, the game portrays the game, <laughs> the, game the, ga- the story is portrayed like over several years, like 40, 50 years or that. So you start off the game, you're like a kid, and then you start crafting this uh, your own sword, or first you take a knife then, and you make it bigger, right? So you, you go over the game, and then kind of like, over the years of the game, you have a better and better sword in the game, because you're always crafting that steel weapon <laughs> between the chapters. So it's really, really interesting. And of course, you're gonna like, uh, you have this friend of Flynn that can't use magic either, the only person you know in your life is also... Um, uh, uh, lack of anima, and then you have your like your companion Kevin, that's this pretty like he's like way great, smart guy, and so you have kind of your party. But Gustavo's storyline is mainly a single character storyline, and sometimes you get help, and he's quite strong, so you don't need that much. And as I mentioned, you will also have like Will's companion, one of them will be in one of the chapters, so on. So you, you know, you kind of combine that a little there. Uh, but the interesting thing, coming to more of the storyline portion, but this is kind of that build up, right? You, you are this kind of useless child. That you get exiled, your father hates you once you're murdered. And oh, yeah, actually, it kind of reminds me of well, this game is way older though, but uh, the One Piece. How uh, so, the spoiler One Piece, the Flamingos, his childhood a little actually, because it's kind of like you're coming from this, you know, he's like the, he's like the son of the mightiest man alive, pretty much the biggest country, pretty much. And suddenly, you're living in this like poverty, like you. First you leave a little money, first you have a little money, and then you get almost like poverty, it's like no money at all, right? Because you run away and have some funds, then you lose them because your father tried to kill you or whatever, your mother or something. And then you go down to being like, you know, living in, 
uh, in the slums pretty much right and actually uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Uda actually played uh, so it feels like that because it's actually quite similar because more so uh, your mother you know she becomes sick because she's not used to uh, you know living this in the, in the slums or whatever so she, she eventually dies from you know random bad immune system or bad food and so on um, actually quite similar <laughs> to, uh, to the the flamingo uh, backstory if you, if you ask me I have several actually similarities. Uh, however, though your little brother, who's your little brother, is it important? Your little brother, who's Philip, he hates you, right? He he is very attached to his mother, and she runs away with you, right? So she he feels that you picked her, and she feels that you picked uh, she picked, picked you over him, right? Which is actually kind of true, I guess. And this story is really really sad, honestly, because Philip is uh, he's gonna hate you, and then when your father dies eventually in you know in the storyline because the years goes in the storyline and so on. He's gonna be like, I wanna murder my brother, right? Because he killed my our mother and so on, and he's like a bastard. He's like you know so on. So um, on, the, on, the, on the same time, you're progressing this drama, political prophet Gustav, because you're, you're gonna build your own country. You're gonna like build your own fucking country uh, from nothing as a revenge to your father. So you're, you're building up, conquering these villages, and you have this, uh, the that strategy modes the game and so on and you like save some princess <laughs> you're building up your own damn city but in the meantime your your brother is gonna you know and, and he's pretty good with the fire bag so he, he's gonna get that um, uh, the crown to be your actual crown you should have and he's gonna make you know fight you in wars because he wants to <laughs> avenge his mother pretty much because he blames you for killing his mother which is actually s- s- it's not slightly true, but it's, the game is quite have this kind of melodramatic story over it. It's kind of you, you know, you, you're always out adventuring, always doing crazy stuff. Uh, as Gustav is, your mother gets more and more sick, so it's a little your fault, actually, I guess. But uh, that's kind of the, the, the main plot of it. Uh, but the thing is that the game is <laughs> the game is really, really sad. Or, I mean, the twist is really going to twist now, so here is the point alert. Um, after you build your own city and you, you create your own country pretty much from nothing and you, you like you build up this massive uh, you know new kind of made your capital on your continent you win the war as your brother primarily and you win some other wars and you kind of build up this you know the grand new world pretty much and everyone loves you because now super loved and everything everyone loves you and your like your childhood friends like Kelvin and so on they're helping you be like your advisors or generals and you can get this made your uh, awesome country that everyone loves you're gonna die. You're gonna fucking die. And that's what makes this game so good and so awesome. Where your main character dies. You know, how often do you see that the main character dies pretty early in the game? The, uh, the game is split into three age eras, pretty much ages. Wheel is much more clear on this. Well, I, I'm talking wheel about later, but in wheel storyline, you play wheel, rich, and uh, rich, rich, and rich, uh, rich, and 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 uh, Gideon, Virginia. So you play three eras of the Knights family, but then Gustavus. So about the time you stop playing as Will, if you look at the timeline, it's pretty much similar. You die as Gustavo. You, you actually die. He's the main character. He's the guy on the on the on the surface of the game. He's the he's the guy you know on the on the on this board and so on. Here you can see the backs as well uh, and so on. And you're gonna die. So you're, you're gonna die like it's about a third or so into the uh, the story, and you die. <laughs> so you just build up this country. You finally reconcile with your with your with your little brother. You find understands that you didn't, you know, that your mother loved your boat, and you actually have all this kind of, and then you die as the main character, and it's just like, what the fuck? I remember playing this game when I was kid. I was like, what? I died? I died? <laughs> you know, the character I am, the character I related to for the last like ten or so hours, for now being like, oh, you have this, you 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 know, you excited, you have no friends, you finally get like one or two friends, and everyone bullies you, and you have to fight that, and you have to like prove yourself, and you have to save those people and build up. You actually build your city. But you, you decide which place to be in the city and so on, like it's just a novel thing, but still and so on, and then you die. And it's also, it's, the game is so good in the storyline, because you die, <laughs> because you die on this way that is so anticlimactic too. And this is why I actually love the game, I can play the game like 10 times over, because the death of Gustave is one of the most like pointless death ever pretty much, in any game or in any story ever. So you're gonna fight against you at some kind of outpost or something uh, in your country and you won you know like 20 20 wars before this and you have defeated like big 
monster bosses or whatever. You you done your shit, you know. Um, <laughs> then you're gonna fight at this like wooden outpost against this like monster swarm. You're like, oh no no, you're like the Kevin. Like no no, take take the take the army, you know, protect the innocent. Let your civilians, because you're a great guy. Let your civilians, you know, do all this crap. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight this monster head on because I'm the strongest person in the world, pretty much. Because he is strong, pretty much. Right? I'm gonna fight these guys. And you know, don't don't. Uh, don't don't say with this guy, he's gonna die. There's a lot of monsters here. I, I'm doing it myself. And then you walk with him and then you start battling this army of monsters. And uh, the game does it so well too. Like it's such a ridiculous uh, way the game does it so well. Because you don't even play Gustave. You don't even get to play Gustave when you die either. You just walk in there and be like, oh he's gonna die now. Well you don't you expect it. You, 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 you're like whatever, right? And then you play this other character, the assassin character I mentioned earlier. Um, from the Red Scorpio, you play him, and so you play him in this kind of like burning wooden place, and you can't escape it, and you just fight enemies until you die. Like that's that you, you don't even play Gustave doing this. It's to make it even weirder too. So you're gonna play this other character, and he's gonna have this endless survival against monsters. You cannot win this battle. You keep coming monsters at you, and you, you keep killing them, and eventually you run down on life points and health points, and you die. And then he also dies. <laughs> and you also had just you also just had this storyline with him, how he escaped it even as has and tribe, so it's also a side storyline with him. So you had it recently with him as well. So I feel it's something for him. And he also dies. <laughs> it's like both of them die there. And it's so weird too, because you don't even get to play Gustavo in the last battle with him. So you play him instead, trying to go and help Gustavo. And they probably have died even before you get there. And then afterwards you get there with Kevin and so on. He's like, oh here are your bodies are and then they broke the sword and so on. It's like wow. And you find, of course, Gustavo's legendary steel weapon, and he's like, man, he definitely died, and you died with your, your side character as well in the game, and he's like, what? One of the biggest twists I've ever seen in my life in a game. So you play, the, you play this game, and the main character that you have followed, uh, you know, on this storyline, I think it's two, two different storylines, you follow this main character, or side characters, you know, close to him and so on, for a lot of time, and he just dies. And this is like a third of the game. It's crazy too, because you still have like, you know, ages wise, you have at least half shadows left on Gustavo's storyline. And uh, as, as I mentioned, with time wise, it's pretty much like 33% or so on done then. then. So it's like, what the fuck? The main character died? And if you think about it, that the game is split into two, two, you actually only play a sixth of the game, and then your main character died. So they kill off the main character so early, actually. This is sick, this game. It's crazy. And it's also been, you know, that's how I remember the game, because the storyline is like, you really build up this really, really tragic storyline for your main character. And then you have more sad stories as well. Um, you find the Rick side with your brother and so on, and then you go and die. Everyone else you can go and die. And afterwards as well, actually I'm, I haven't have played it for like a year or so, but for a little two years now, but actually your brother's gonna die as well. That is also really sad. So you're gonna, actually it happens early, think about it. But, uh, yeah, so it's like your, your brother, you find a fit with him, and you, he's ruling some part of that country, I think you conquer a bit of that, um, your father's old country, a little bit, but whatever, you have this peace thing going on right now, and then someone comes and, like, uh, he's, he has son, your, your nephew, is gonna do his ritual, that you failed in the beginning of the game, you did that first thing and you failed, right, and so you're gonna, you know, he, he's gonna be the the next in that country right that, that empire so you do the fire ritual and uh, then you get assassinated by people claiming it didn't work for you so you get the uh, the you know the blame for it pretty much that's just how it's very tragic and of course your brother goes crazy he grabs the fire sword this, this leg in the fire sword and that invokes it on like a maximum level and turns into this kind of like this fire dragon um, it's because this crazy monster like burned down shit and so on. So it happens way before this way. And, I, and then you're about to die there and so on. And also later in the game, of course, like it's basically later in the game where when you're about to lose your, uh, your capital, but this is like 10 or 50 years after you actually die in Gustavo, this is way later, you're gonna get saved by that dragon. But your brother, the fire dragon, your brother is gonna come and save you uh, after you die. So it's, it's a very, very tragic and everything and all. Uh, this course it also ends the line of course of your whole your your father's country and your own country so this is very important though because the storyline after this is very very interesting 
so you, you, your main character died, <laughs> right? So you, you so now you're sort of playing like Kelvin and his older friends. You're gonna play as like his friends and trying to keep keeping the political working and all the wars and so on and political drama and so on. So it's actually it's very intriguing how you got the game um, kind of works in that in, in that favor uh, and so on. But uh, I'm trying to do a little here with the sword. I'm mean, that's the major thing. That's the major thing with this game. Is that the main character is gonna die? <laughs> like even before roughly, I would say I guess a little like halfway in or so on the Gustavo storyline because the storyline goes a little faster. I think it's less chapter in the storyline than all the storyline. So yeah, we could die somewhere before half of it. <laughs> so it's like you die, you're out of the picture with your main character. You must start time. It's it's it's, it's, it's really weird feeling to do that game that you. They actually kill off the the, the protagonist uh, completely, and then you you know you follow his friends and so on, other people uh, that he uh, he affected during his life and so on. Um, but on the other storyline, then you're following Will. That's at the beginning, you know, he's hunting for this uh, quest they're called, giving you the infinite uh, value of the magic, right? As the fire sword is the, that's one of those quests. Obviously, there's a known quell and belonging to the royalty, so you can't buy that. You try to find other ones in ancient ruins, then you sell them for yourself to be stronger. So, uh, and and you know, Will has this. It's a pretty. He has the kind of the weird background story where his his father and his two uncles are also these kind of hunters, uh, diggers, and they uh, all got killed <laughs> by his uh, his evil uncle. And killed them all when they found this. Uh, Megalite, it's called Megalite, Megalite, Megalite. That's like the a super wash of this quest that gives you like infinite magic in something or even some more magic. And he, he got that and then he killed other ones in this desert town. And so you'll be living at your uh, your aunt's place. So your, yeah, I think, yeah, it's your aunt's place. So the sister of your um, your late father. And so here's the kind of the background story, obviously, is that you kind of. You don't know it in the beginning, it kind of gives you the, after the first second chapter or so, you kind of get the more background story. And obviously you're going to fight your uncle, it's kind of obvious in that storyline that your uncle is kind of your, you know, your, your enemy, you're going to have to kill your uncle eventually um, in, in his storyline. And um, yeah, so I read it is actually, the game kind of beats it up, so you find more stuff, you meet more friends. He he has more of a relatable no uh, sorry relationship kind of storyline right? where you meet a girl and another girl and you kind of flirt with them and you can actually actually one of them is either gonna die if you bring her with your party when you fight your uncle in the end of his storyline or you're gonna bring your aunt, your aunt when she dies instead uh, so depending on who you bring with on, on you, or having your party you you marry <laughs> you have like he has like two flings and one of them might die so if he dies he marries the other one uh, doesn't actually affect the, the, the change of story you have to have the same son <laughs> afterwards they have the same son afterwards but it's like yeah you have actually changed the story a little bit um so anyway in his storyline you're gonna face more of his megalites which kind of beats it up right so you have your all you have um, these two siblings so you Wife, pretty strong, and then one of them is gonna get the like an ice megalite in uh, like this ice ruin or this kind of ice temple or whatever you expect, like a gigantic place of ice. It kind of reminds you of the desert that you found earlier in the story, um, where you're trying to kind of discover why your father was killed by your uncle and so on. So you kind of see similarities there. And then he turns evil into kind of gigantic monsters. So clearly, these kind of megalites are, um, if you can't control them, you become this monster, right? And you can't fight just to run away and kill him and so on. So it's kind of sad as well. You just murder this uh, brother of his one of your main party members and <laughs> so on. So the game is the game is quite harsh on the storyline. People die and so on. As I mentioned, people both leave your story and so on. Also, but also people die. <laughs> you have to kill them and so on because they turn evil and so on. So it, and it's not like going back. You have to kill your friend here. And it, okay, I guess it, his storyline, the monster in the eyes, it's not that actually invested in him. It's more that like his sister is more a character you play with and so on, and then you have to murder his brother, her brother. That's, I guess, more the storyline there. Um, but yeah, in the end of his storyline, you have to, you, you will either you will like die with your, um, your girl if you die, <laughs> if you have to with her, or your aunt that raised you. So it's kind of like, and then you kill your, your uncle. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier with the Sargon thing, when he evil, your uncle on Will's storyline is actually will die in this cavern, 
and that's where you go and we kill your friends with Daniel Sargon. So actually, it's, but his story is on the Gustavo storyline. So that's how they kind of combine the storyline with, like, yeah, this main character here killed the evil guy here, and that creates some kind of, you know, magic ritual shit down in the, in the dungeon, in the specific dungeon, right? And then you go to the other character there. For the other storyline, he turns evil when he gets to that place. So that's kind of like how they want to entwine the thing in the game. It's very interesting. But anyway, the game does this does it several times though, it's kind of neat, detailed, interesting storyline, because after this, it's very interesting, because, um, so after you kill your uncle, you defeat him, he's also a boss earlier on, you want to have Gustavus, things like this, and so on, so they also all some other parts where you fight your uncle, um, you know, in other places and so on, and that also kind of builds the story up, and, and after that, you get into this weird, actually, I think it's really, really well done, because after this, you start this new story, the game jumps like, I think like 20 years or something. It jumps 20 years or more, or like or less, or something around there. And then you play as this new female called Eleanor. Uh, and she has two of your main partners with you. That has, that has been from the star party, the Georgian party, later on when all the characters like left or so on. So she has those two with but they're older, they're like 20 years older. And then this other guy called Richard is like, he's there. And you recognize this character, like, oh, this is the old, uh, my old, my old friends, right? But she's a new character, it's like, whatever. And then you finish two chapters with her, and this is, again, this is a big spoiler again, it's a big twist, right? And you, you, you're figuring out, like, I'm playing this new female character. She, she is like, what, what is she? What, what is her backstory and so on? And you don't really get one, and you, 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 you recognize all the two guys, because they work on your team, right? So you're like, why don't they or the leaders? So you know, they're more experienced. They actually have better stats over the year. They actually jump in stat levels. So I'm trying to use that's nice, and so on. So you kind of like, uh, it's kind of weird. But then you you complete your quest. It's like going in some ruin and then some forest, and you beat some boss there and get some stuff. And obviously, it's the same kind of job that Will used to have. And they are there to us. They're doing your old job then. So it's kind of like you know the, the hunting, the digging thing. And but after this chapter is finished. You actually follow Richard when he goes home. He's like, oh yeah, my first real mission feeling. That's pretty good. And then I follow him home. And he's actually leaving with Will. And he's Will's son. And it's like, what the fuck? So the game has this really beautiful thing where it's like, you're playing this female character. And uh, in the end of her storyline, you swap into the male character that she had with her. And the unknown male character. You have two other male characters you recognize. Right? And then the fourth character in your party, that was just like dear. He has some lines and... He didn't do much, you follow him, I uh, was fighting, but he didn't do much in the, like lore-wise, or whatever, nerd wise And then you suddenly, you see his perspective, and he's the main character now. Because he's the son of the last main character, yeah, you didn't know! So the game is it's really, really nice on this part, because it's like, what? Uh, uh, he's the main character? What, isn't she the daughter? Well, no, no, she was just, um, she was just the, the, the party leader, because it was his first mission, so he didn't want to be the party leader, right? <laughs> it's like, and the uh, one to do with this is, father's old friend right so it was like his friend so yeah <laughs> he's the main character now and the game just does that it's just a detailed very nice subtle way of just you know carrying on the torch in this like you can twist the way to that you just don't tell you oh yeah but no let's have time to wear no you're playing as your main character son the end they were like 20 years yup now you're playing as this unknown female oh yeah her boyfriend is actually the main <laughs> something like that almost like it's like what uh, it, it's really, really interesting, and so then this new story is with Richard, and um, his storyline is he's kind of hunt. He talks about the egg um, that his uncle, or his great uncle, that your uh, Will's uncle, um, and he kind of figure out. Uh, I don't know Will sort of does it, but he more figure out because he saw the aspect it, that the egg is something, you know, something evil, right? It's called the egg in the game. That's the main villain, the main antagonist. It's, it's it's called egg right and there with his his great his grandfather and his brother and great uncles they got from the desert right and this absolute evil whatever you can call it so he he's you know something searching for that more because he hear rumors that it's left the dungeon and so on so he's uh, he's after that and uh, and so on right and uh, on his storyline then you're gonna like meet his girls you're gonna like flirt with people and so on and you eventually you're gonna, you know, meet a woman and she's gonna become pregnant. If there's a chapter in the storyline when your girlfriend is pregnant, you have to protect her from like monsters like 
you know, running with her through some mountains and forests to get to like your father or where she was safe or something and so on. So you really have this relatable story, like relatable, but you know what I mean? Like, this more down to earth story. Love. It's like, yeah, your girlfriend is pregnant, but you're living in this freaking magic or forest and even monsters have to run away from there and so on. So there's way more different storyline chapters than, uh, than previous. And the order gets general and he, like he's working and so on. And uh, yeah, he's like, he dies as well. <laughs> like he also will die. The game is the game is really harsh, and it's, the twist in the game is it's, it's amazing. He will find a, a woman that has the egg now. The the main, it's, his family pretty much is hunting with, and she fights her in this kind of like spider nest kind of weird mountain, and he's literally you know gonna like kill her, but she jumps down the cliff or something with the egg, and he's like I have to take the egg because no one can get the egg, and he and he actually you never see him die. But it's very, very implied that you jump down with the egg when you're playing Richard, and he commits suicide purposely. Like he takes the egg uh, from her, so you don't actually have it right, and he commits suicide with it, so that he will die with the egg in some kind of you know, uh, you know, some hole or whatever, and uh, so no one can use it. So it's very, very tragic. And also, it's like what I just invested like the last five or so hours with a new character. That I even I, I just protected my pregnant uh, girlfriend or fiance or whatever, not married, and, and so on. And I'm like I'm like I'm waiting for my child to get born, and then bam, oh you died, like you, you commit suicide. And it's like what the fuck, you know? Okay, they all killed off Gustavus, they all killed Richard. Uh, yeah, this game has really good story because it, it, the twists are crazy, and respect it, and it's how they portray it too. Like you start out with Richard. In this weird way, and then you really get deep into it, like your relationship, you follow that, and then you die, <laughs> right? And then you have to commit suicide pretty much, and um, yeah. And then the game, game jumps like 13, 14 years, and then you of course play his daughter instead, Virginia, or Guinness called it in the game. And then her story is uh, played up and so on. And yeah, like, I'm not going to over this, but the game is really, really nice and things. And of course, here the game actually also then really builds into the storyline because in Gustavo's storyline, or actually like he's he's dead, <laughs> he's been dead for like twenty years with him, but in his like on Flynn on Kelvin's storyline and Kevin I guess mainly, and his like son or so like their storyline with like the the people that inherit the, the Gustavo kingdom he created and like his brother and the kid you know whatever people that took his brother's uh, throne or fighting you know, with them and so on. They're gonna end up with this situation where a guy called Gustave is gonna, you know, try claim he is the real his son of Gustave, and it really builds up nicely because first he's gray-haired and then he's gonna meet someone and he's gonna be like, oh, but Gustave wasn't he a uh, blonde, you know, big long blonde hair? He's like blonde, and then she's like, he's blonde, and so on. So you're gonna build this guy up that he's obviously an imposter. We as play noted, but no one really know you know really knows whatever in the world. But it's also gonna be a lot of hints to it, and yeah, to more twist to here. Obviously, he is the egg. Like he's not actually the egg, right? But he has the egg. So that's how they're gonna combine it. Even if Richard committed suicide, stop the egg. Somehow the egg is gonna get out from that place and get to this guy. They the which is never named. I believe he's always just called the imposter Gustavo, um, or the fake Gustavo thing. He's never named, no name in that. And he's gonna get the egg, and he's gonna. I know the egg has bigger plans, so the egg, you know, controls him to kind of control the world, so to speak. So, you, so then you really get the story into it, right? Because, uh, so in the same time here, you're gonna play as uh, Virginia, and she's gonna you know, do some quests, get some friends, and she's gonna like try to do some adventures and so on, kind of, uh, in her beginning. But at the same time, then in this uh, Gustave storyline, they're gonna have to fight the armies of the egg, really, like the. the Evil and uh, Gustave and and so on, so that, that's really really interesting and and, and to kind of and then further, but you, and you kind of you but you don't know it in the beginning because I mean the, the game really does as well with the narrative that it tells you a lot of information, but there was like something hidden so you have to really think about it really figure out where you have to keep playing right and then you're, oh that's how they are combined or that's how it works so you kind of expect that something strange of course with the fake Gustave. And you could hear hints that has some really big magic and so on, which is the reverse of Gustave, so no one actually knows Gustave, the video player, uh, would ever believe he's a Gustave's son because he has a really good magic. Um, 
so the build up they kind of hinted his egg actually more and more and so on like it's pretty nice uh, but at the same time you're gonna have this a weird um, combination how Flynn's grandson and so on they're gonna like or his has his, his son or he him and his sons are kind of controlling the territory of Gustave and they have those arguments and so on and so you're gonna play as his older son I believe it is He's got the army, he was army and so on, and he's gonna have a lot of fight with his uh, little younger brother about how they should do it and so on. Uh, but then, so they're very disagreement, and, his, and the thing is that his younger brother is really portrayed like an idiot. I would, I would say that my point is that his younger brother, so Kevin's second son, is portrayed as being in the wrong right. And But the interesting thing then is that, to make it more twisted and more combined, is that you're actually gonna play as his, um, the, the Calvin's second son's son. Gustav, he's gonna be uh, like the main character later on. So even if he's like, you kind of get the feeling that oh he's like a loser, the second son, he doesn't do much. You're playing as this, his older brother in the Gustav storyline. You're actually gonna find Gustav uh, as Virginia. <laughs> so on the same storyline, like, same storyline, she will meet the Gustav and he will join her team, right, and so on. So you're actually playing with. Um, that's what the game is interested to play also in the kind of the. Chapter by chapter, why? Because you get the, get the same timeline, right? Because you, so while they are fighting, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you saw so, you, you really like look at the, your brother in this story that you're playing his your uncle of good stuff." And he's like, "That this guy's a loser. He's such a loser. I'm the real leader of this now." You're actually gonna play the other guy at the same time in the both storylines. So while uh, you're playing as Flynn's son fighting the egg with the more the war thing, you're gonna play as Virginia, which is kind of the, like backtracking her. Father's footstep, kind of finding that place where he admits suicide and goes kind of sad and so on. With Gustav, also trying to figure out what is this fake Gustav? Like, is he something? Uh, you know, how does that work and so on? And he kind of understands, of course, that Virginia knows more than she tells so on because she is the granddaughter of. We'll actually pretty much know all about the whole egg and the mega lights and everything. He knows pretty much everything. So, <laughs> you know, it's really, really building it up. Um, but the game does really well too because you get Gustav. Uh, it's not that the game tells you that that is Gustavus best friend's grandson, I guess that's how the line works. He's just kind of there in the beginning. And he's like, ah, oh, he's an adventurer. I mean, actually, of course, has a much more agenda, but you don't know that and it doesn't tell you that. So it, they really love this kind of, the, the subtile um, way you do it. And the thing is that the Gustav, for example, you understand pretty quickly what he is because... Or something like that, because he has the firebrand, that was the sword uh, from the royal family that turned um, Philip into a dragon. He also has Gustavus' old steel sword. So he's equipped with like a combination of the two kingdoms, so to speak, the best weapons, right? And he has those two legendary weapons with him. Uh, but nothing else, and the name, of course. So you have to kind of, ah, it's something like that. And it's only in the end of the game, pretty much, where he kind of reveals that he is the son of that guy, and that's how he is kinda actually inherently of the world kingdom and everything is you know they have some kind of pieces to it but it's very nicely um, very nicely combined and also of course in the end of the game as you talked about several times today you met the last boss the egg which is absolutely impossible that boss is fucking crazy you can't beat it um, but you get it pretty much with the, with Virginia and you get a wheel back you also can't miss you get a wheel back but it's like 62 or something in the game so he has like, I don't know, like a five, fifth of health. You can actually, you can grind it up as well. But it's kind of, kind of funny because he has like whatever health when you left him last time. And now 40 is late in the game. He has like a third of his uh, last health. Uh, but he keeps his skills. So he can be like 99 in water or something and kill everything one hit. But <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, you're playing your your original first character that survived. Because the other character died, right? And he is uh, super weak now in health but stuff because he's so old. <laughs> so you play him and you have Gustav and so on. So they kind of combine because Gustav is kind of like a strong and Gustav, right? So you kind of get back into the old, the, the finally meeting after each other, kind of, because they're going to die, which you didn't expect to do. Um, so yeah, and then you, you, you won't beat the last boss because it's possible, but you, you can beat it if you really, really grind from the beginning and so on. Um, and also you will fight like the, the Sargon guy, you will fight him for example in, the, in this last dungeon that was a playable character and so on, so it has yes, a really weird, ni nice feeling to it. Um, so the, I mean the game has a massive quarter story, I, I covered most of it, but it's really really interesting. Uh, with a lot of details and so on and so forth, a lot of the characters, a lot of relationships and so on, but 
you in general like that you have your main character and he dies <laughs> that's just like what and then you have your like second main character that also dies <laughs> you're like what is this game can they never keep anyone and like the, the ages and so on to so one character like oh i'm too old for this i'm just gonna like, retire some other character is like angry at you because you you know you married the older woman so she leaves your party and kind of kind of like that um yeah, and this is really, really tragic downplay on it all the time, and it's 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 also a very tragic game. Anything in storyline, it's very, very tragic. It's very mature, I would say. It's not a very like easy going game for a second, and it's really like oh, he committed suicide, kind of stopped there, this evil thing. Like okay, that's that's kind of like how the game feels. It's not very really like, it's not very, you know, going funny kind of. As for, at all, it never has any comedic moment pretty much, it's very serious all the time, it's very very dead, dead serious, tragic story all the way through pretty much. Um, but as I mentioned in the end, it really combines the characters, so for example, while you have this war against the egg, and of course you beat the army, uh, with the, the last part of the Gustave story that was played by his best friend's son, which is the uncle of Gustav, I think, if I remember correctly. That kind of is actually beaten, and then kind of game ends there actually for him. And then at the same time, you have the last dungeon with Virginia after that because the egg flees into this dungeon, right? Which is an order kind of mega late dungeon, and then you kill the egg in there, right? And of course, it's really stop being an egg and because of form. And actually, it's a lot of subtle story that I'm going to point out. Which is going to spoil how the whole world works, but actually, all these quells you have in the ruins. Or actually human souls. That's how they explain it. So all these kind of like, you know, the, the, the items you have gathered over these like 40, 50 years of the game. And that are really strong on the wheel side primarily. Or all like, uh, you know, people that have died. And I don't remember exactly what to say how it works. But I either kill a lot of people, I think. I think Sorgan Spain that they killed a lot of people. Like a lot of souls that are like fused into items in ancient past. So they created these kind of items. Or like they have some tragic life or... You know, strong emotions, something. So they're like, um, they're like tormented souls, and of course the megaliths, that the egg and so on are, so kind of like, you know, the the millions evil souls or like demon souls or whatever that are like fused into items that have been destroyed or killed or whatever, right? And are in constant torment, uh, torment or something, and that's why they drive people insane and touch them, and stuff like that, and why they are, you know, pure evil and so on. So they, they kind of like. Gives all the game kind of oh so I've actually like at the end of the game it's like oh yeah oh oh I see so all the magic I ever used except the nature magic where I was was actually like me sending like tormenting people old people soul and send them to people oh that's that's nice <laughs> so I'm actually kind of explain the game a little bit but I want to point it out mainly because it's not a bad storyline at all I think that actually kind of explains why for example he killed his friends each kind of in the dungeon and so on. Uh, it's kind of uh, people have missed them maybe because I've talked to people about this game in the past right? and they oh that's how it worked because that's kind of a detail you only get if you talk to him uh, in the last dungeon and you, you can either fight him as a party or as, as, as a single duel and I think this, he, he explains stuff to you differently depending on how you play or so on I think or depending on if you miss some side story I don't know it's something like that you actually miss it out I think but I might be wrong but I think some, some, something like that you can at least skip his whole battle and skip his whole where he is as this fire god kind of thing. So you can, you can at least skip that completely in the game if you want and never get the dialogue. So it's actually absolutely possible to skip that. Um, so it's a very important last dialogue there in the ending from him at least when he explains how, how the Mandy kind of works, how the infinite Mandy kind of works with dead people. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, the game has a lot of that. Um, the world building is very interesting. Um, um, but also just generally, like the, the game really gives a little wow motion when you play it. Of course, as I said, that's what it gave it to Horror Cell because it goes to a twist like, well, you're gonna play his main character, he's gonna die. <laughs> if you don't, you know, that's actually one of the big moments in the game, right? In any game, really. I mean, I have played a lot of role playing games, I collect role playing games, so to speak, um, but very few of them were main characters die, right? Like, of course, Arity in 57. But this is more like Cloud dead. <laughs> this is more like your your dead. The character you are playing as got killed. And um, but the thing is that if, for example in for seven where Aerith is you know, she's built up and she has some backstory and so on. I think that uh, Gustav's backstory is ten times better than Aerith. It's not even close to the backstory of Gustav. Gustav, you really have this like 
you're following this character from your born. Okay, you're following this character from the moment you were born, and then you see a chapter of your life from your like five or so until you're like fifteen. Like you see a few months of your year constantly, how you're growing, how you're getting friendship, how you're bullied, so on. You know, the typical outcast, but then you're, you know, slowly get getting people's attention and respect and so on. And then you're a little older, like old teenager, young adult, and you're starting to actually build your own country. And you do all this. And you're really, it's a nice guy to, you know, you save people, you protect people. And then eventually you just die. And, and, and it's so anticlimactic to, I think it's even better. Because it's, you're not facing this gigantic, for example, the egg or the megalith. You're not facing the gigantic demon god, right? You're not facing the armies of your your brother or other enemies you had during the storyline. For example, you can face a dragon for your brother or something. But they might have killed you because there are a lot of burning. So it's, it's a little deluded there. But perhaps. But you're facing these random monsters like these frogs or whatever. That's like this abundance of monsters that goes, that goes crazy. Perhaps because your brother. And um, yeah, and this other character you also kind of started going into also died. And you pick him instead, and you both die. <laughs> you're like, oh, you bite, you, you, you make sure you die. And it's just anticlimactic in the sense that you're just like, oh yeah, I died to this random uh, mobs. <laughs> but you know, I died to this level one boars. But it was, it was a million of them, so I died to them. Not the gigantic finisher. And it just gives you the game, just kind of like, yeah, it's, this is really like sad. Um, but also in the sense that you, you don't even get the last fight with your main character. Uh, and I think it makes it more impactful. You lose the main character, he dies quite early in the game, actually, after building up everything about him, and you don't even get to make a good feel with him. It's like, oh, you died. You died off screen. You, you die off screen with the main character in the game. Often you see that in the game. And then you have your, your like, second main character, the other storyline, your son of your main character, storyline, uh, Richard, and he commits suicide pretty much uh, on screen, but still like that. It's all sad, <laughs> so on. And I have to can go back to that place with your daughter, and it's really, it's just really, really, it's really, really nice on this game. It's, um, I mean, the best part especially, but also I think it's really sad. I actually kind of like the whole part with like how Philip hates you, your younger brother Gustavo, because he felt you you killed your mother, and that storyline, and his son is getting killed, and. Assassination of his son is also pretty good, and this overall storyline there is nice. Um, and the end, then you actually get the only weak part of the storyline is kind of like after Gustav that it's really interesting, but after a few more chapters there, then it's kind of like okay, no, it's a little weird. Who is the control? Is it Kelvin? And that's a little weird for a bit there, but then it becomes a kind of drama who's the best son of him and so on, and they get back to track again. So that's a little weird there, but. Overall, that's really, really interesting. And of course, then, the other storyline is also quite interesting. I haven't read really that too much because I think that requires a lot more details to cover and how to explain. We just be talking to it now and I have to kind of replay the game to really remember all this exactly. But it's kind of like on the other storyline with uh, with Will, it's also a lot like your, your your uncle is pure evil. He murdered your father and your other uncle and so on. But you can understand after seeing your friend turning into this ice megalith and you have to kill your friend or kind of you, you abandon him in this kind of gigantic ice castle so to speak so you kind of kill him or whatever where he's doing drown that's about that and, and it's like you know you, you can understand that your uncle isn't actually evil he's just controlled by the evil right he's possessed but you have to kill your own uncle so that's it's still kind of right it's still kind of tragic and, and, and definitely it's not I was like, alluded to it. You have you have this big story part where you come to the death of your father died, and you talk to people and they explain to you that oh we saw your father, you were like best friends. So you saw these three, you know brothers were made and your sister your aunt talked about that. Oh they were best friends and I I don't get how that was evil and how it happened so. And then when they return after you know the uh, with the egg right they all like I have to have it. So they killed each other. So they started having this major. Uh, slaughter of the Cedar and, and, and the other port members and just kill everyone. He was the one, the last one to survive, so to speak. Um, so there's a lot of tragic in that. It's not like it's an easy <laughs> going moment. There's like, oh, Monk is evil, let's go kill him. It's more like, okay, my uncle is possessed. Uh, and I, I kind of know that, but I still have to kill him to free his spirit, so to speak. And then, of course, your own son gets possessed to so commit suicide before he can turn evil. 
So that's why he does it because he knows, of course, from his father, story about his grandfather that you will turn evil, right? So he ke- kills this woman, that has the egg, and then he's like, "What should I do with it now?" It's like, "Fuck it, I have to, I have to kill myself pretty much before I will turn the next evil, right?" And it, it's quite tragic. Um, so the storyline is really good, yeah. It's really, really good, and but also as I mentioned that you have the story part where you play it's fake story a little. You have the story part where you play a saga and his right hand man and he's killing people and he meets up with him and so yeah, this general story part where you like see a lot of the game is very well made in that sense, but also I feel very typical of the Japanese role games that are very good in the sense or the Japanese media where you play you see a lot of the scenes from for example Philip, so you understand why he hates your main character. You know, you really understand why he blames you for your mother being dead. You also blame yourself for that a little. And as I mentioned, all the side characters and so on, kind of building them up. So a lot of the characters has really good storyline. It's about the characters don't don't at all. They're just, just kind of there. But it's also kind of fine. Because a lot of, you have like 30 plus playable characters. But like 20 of them, I guess 15 or so of them, are just going to be in like one or two or three chapters. Like some extra recruit. And then they leave permanently. So whatever, right? So it's, it kind of works actually. And it's... Yeah, this is very, it's very nicely done. Everything together, all about how they combine stuff and, uh, but especially the twists. I mean, just at least like I mentioned, the the Richard, just that kind of thing. Also, the main character so on, but also that, oh, you're playing this new female character. Oh, interesting, and you see your older characters and interact with her and so on. They kind of teaching her and your this other guy how the stuff works. And you're like, okay, so this is my new main character. You you know you, you the game is portraying it from her perspective right, her mind and so on. So you like getting into her, being like, okay, this is my new main character. What's my goals? Uh, is she maybe the daughter of Will or something? And you kind of you know you work into that. That's like nope, you you she's just she's gone. She has the main character now. She was just the leader for whatever reason because she wanted to be the leader. Who's the main character? It's like what? Then she's never in the game again. <laughs> she's like never in the game again. Um, it's just this, this game does it in so many levels. Like it does its strategy thing, its build up thing, and it kind of likes to you know you know <laughs> rip the rug under your feet and give you this really weird, these major twisters, amazing kind of correlation with the characters and how everything in the world is combined and so on. And also this kind of really nice details where you're just like, no, that's the main character. You're sorry we tricked you. <laughs> and they do it a lot of the times, but that's why it's so hard to explain it to anyone. Without spoiling it, right? Because you have this, all of these kind of major twists, but there are minor, kind of funny, uh, minor details where you're like, yeah, actually, that's the main character. Or like, no, 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 you're evil. Because <laughs> a lot of the saga, when you're like, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna, uh, his, his storyline is more than than this, though, but in general, his chapter, you, you go into this dungeon, absolutely the place where you killed uh, your uncle with Will, but this one is Gustavo Slider, so as I mentioned, you. Again, the very nice narrative there because like you're you're unlocking that place earlier with Will, right? I think you did twice with Will, uh, with, with Richard. But anyway, you're in a dungeon, this kind of mountain dungeon, and then like ten or so years later, Gustavus right, you get this as well. You go there, and then you're playing as Hans and Gretel, as I called <laughs> Sorgon, yeah, and you end killing your friends. Like you, you see it from his perspective, I think, or like her. Perspective. You just see him for an hour after three years. He's at their mentor or something, and then you end up in this dungeon in the, in the bottom of this uh, cave, and, and then you, you murder your friends. What kind of this stuff does it for you? It's, it's very illuded if you murder them, or if that you're in this room, and then just kills everyone that is there, except the strongest one, and just kind of picks the one that it wants to survive. It seems, based on the story too, I guess that you enter this room with them, and then it killed them and infused their soul into your body, so he could turn into this kind of fire demon later on in the game, I guess. Because, you know, like the Quells and Megalite, he got infused by their life source, something like that. It might be it. Anyway, it's kind of interesting in the whole thing because you're absolutely playing a good character. He's a good character, he wants to save his village, but, uh, you know, help these kids, the teenagers, to become stronger and so on. And in the end, you, you kind of kill them somehow. I mean, it's kind of your fault. And, um,. Uh, you know, <laughs> then you turn evil. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're actually, you're actually, you're the evil guy. <laughs> I was like, what? I'm evil? <laughs> I was like, oh, this next story. Like, you know, it's um, it's really, really interesting um, how how the game uh, traces itself. Uh, you know, and it's just how the age e- 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 works and how you're like, oh, I see my pregnant wife and then she gets burst and then the next main character and so on. The game really has this, really brought it down to it. And so obviously, 
this game is always going to be a 10 out of 10 storyline. It's one of the best stories I've ever read in my life. In any category, I think it's way better than most books I've read in my life, most movies I've seen. Then we coming close to this game. You said they follow the characters for so many years. They follow them for 40, 50 years. Um, and as I mentioned again, they kind of get the kind of the, I don't know, take a trip and get like on or whatever. Like, oh, well, the main character died so early. That, that is pretty impactful. But also in the way that the main character dies. I said it, I said it before, but I said it again. The main character dies in a very anticlimactic way. Makes it even better, I think, because you have done so much with Gustavo. You have conquered this place, you have fought this, you have reached your brother, you've done so many things, fought so many, you know, bosses and so on. And then you just die to this like random 10 random mobs that surround you, and you're like, oh shit, and you get killed by this like this flood of like level one enemies that surround you, and you're one of your like, best fighter, and they both die. And you're just like, what the fuck? And I couldn't even play him, so you can't even. You know, you just end this battle with the character and then it's over. <laughs> it's just, it's a breathtaking experience with the pain in the game. Of course, I pretty much spoil everything now, but that's what I meant, right? Because the game has big spoilers and also these minor detail spoilers. Overall, the narrative is amazing. So now I've been ranting way too much about that, so I had to cut myself there. I was like, what? Well, this is crazy. Um, but in the end, yeah, like this, this game has really, really good storyline. This game has this amazing amazing storyline and um, I just want to I don't want to cover more about the storyline itself because there are more details I haven't said everything but I said most of it I guess uh, but the last thing really is that it's not about what the storyline actually covers but it's more about that the game does it in a well way so I just want to talk about those points a little more even though I feel I'm kind of redundant repetitive but the thing is that right, the game again then the game does for example as I mentioned the game really tricks you, right? It tricks you in a really, really nice way where it's like, oh, you're actually evil. Or oh, this is not the main character. So that's something that's very, very interesting. Something that I hope that more games can do. It's something that, actually, by, by recording this, talking about this and analyzing the game and going all forth and so on, it's actually inspired myself, I say. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of look back to the game and say, this is really interesting. This is what more games should do. And I have used some of that in my own games. Um, and it helped not so much, but I'm thinking about it more, it's actually one of the real highlights of the game. Not necessarily that the kids the main character. It actually is, I don't want to call it a cheap trick, I think it's a brave trick, uh, so to speak. But the actually, the, the really, really, when I think about it, that makes the game really, really, really good. It's not that it dares to do that, it's how it does it. So I said again, you actually get the end climatic how your main character dies, that's very rare. But also then the other things that oh this this is not the game main character this is actually that thing, or oh, you you use no this character also died so that's kind of, it's more like it's not only about what it does with the storyline it's how it does it, and that's also why you know it's an interesting game right, it gives you something that a movie, or a book can't really do uh, in the same way especially a movie or something, because of time frame and so on because this game really like you play this character. You really immerse yourself into this character, and you never expect that they're gonna do something like that with the main character. Or as I mentioned, I don't think it's interesting because you're you're starting to immerse yourself into a character, and then they're just like, nope, that's not the main character. You are wrong. He's never in the game again. <laughs> so, you know, it's like what? So it's kind of like she died. She didn't die, but you know, you you start spending time with this new character and start to invest time into her. And understanding her, seeing from her perspective, seeing her, you know, you you write from her, her mind, right? Her perspective is suddenly, nope, no, not anymore. This is it's out. <laughs> you know? And it does stuff like that as well. There's a lot of brave stuff, a lot of crazy stuff, to speak. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, I haven't even covered... I'm basically just be covering kind of the, like, the main storyline, so it's a good part of it. Uh, like, it's talk one or two more hours about this game, and... Without not going into the details, I think I covered pretty much what's good with it. And but yeah, it's an amazing, amazing story. It's at Baron Thunder of Ten. Um, easily, if you ask me, the best uh, narrative to the PlayStation One. Easily, it's way better than most stuff you'll find in any media. Um, I can hardly say anything that I would feel is, is, is as good in this time frame. Like, would I say all the series that are like 800 episodes or something are better? Yeah, because if you if you can do something 800 episodes, 
and it's still good <laughs> that's really good um obviously this game is very short than that so it's like comparing it to other role-playing games so like i don't know one season of a tv series i guess so like one and a half or something like that i guess like a um, similar numbers of time you spend into it so the death of fair and i can i can barely come up with anything being close to this um so yeah i definitely recommend playing this game even though I just spoiled pretty much everything about it, so you will, <laughs> so you know, know everything happened. You should not watch the spoilers. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it for me. I hope you really enjoyed this. I hope you, even if you play the game, especially play the game, I think. I think if anything, if you play this game like 20 years ago and you just want to see someone sit here and talk about its good memories of this great game, I hope you really enjoyed this. And uh, I'll see you next time.